Hey folks, today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a landing page, a beautiful gallery, a professional blog, or an online store, it's all included with your Squarespace website. WTFPod.com is powered by Squarespace. Make your site a Squarespace site too. Start your free trial today at Squarespace.com and enter offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace, set your website apart. We're also sponsored by CISO, the all-comedy ad-free streaming TV service made for the serious comedy fan. Go check it out at SEESO.com. They've got every episode of comedy classics like 30 Rock, Parks and Recreation, Monty Python, The Kids in the Hall, Alan Partridge, The Mighty Boosh, and so much more. Get late night comedy the next day. The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, The Late Show with Seth Meyers and SNL. Plus stand up specials and never before seen original series. Go to CISO.com to start a one month trial for free. Yeah, baby. All right, let's do this. How are you? What the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fuck Ricans? What the fucksters? What the fuck Nicks? Yeah, what the fuck Nicks? How about that? Old school. Hey, it's me, Mark Marin. This is WTF. It's my podcast. I'm in New York City. I'm here for uh, an opening of a famous artist, uh, Sarah Kane, uh, the Sarah Kane, her show Dark Matter. Opens tonight, Thursday night, September 8th, here in New York City at the Gallery Le Long. That's gallery with an I-E at the end because it's fucking fancy. Some fancy business. I went over there and looked at my partner's ugh, girlfriend, I don't know, lady friend, person I'm seeing. I still don't partner just doesn't it doesn't work for me. I know that's everybody, you know, partner, partner. What does that mean? I got called Brendan, my producer and business partner, my partner, but then I have to qualify it with like business partner. So obviously I know that the word has implications. But uh maybe my chick, is that still does that not kosher? No, no good. <laughs> I'll go with the lady I'm seeing. The woman the woman in my life. Oh, boy. She's giving me the thumbs up in her bathrobe on the bed. So I went over there and looked at the show, and I got to say, it's pretty spectacular. It's like going to a... It's like going to an abstract theme park. Very full-body experience. Full-body immersion in the uh, the art of Sarah Kane. If you want to go to the opening, it's open to the public tonight here in New York City. Six to eight at Gallery Le Long. So uh, what else? On the show today, Billy Crystal. The Billy Crystal. Uh, the the great, one of the great Jewish funny men. Can I call him that? Sure. Why not? Oh, before you uh, fast forward to Billy, uh, new WTF cat mugs are available from Brian Jones up in Portland. These are the same mugs I give to my guests they go on sale at 12 noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Go to brianrjones.com to get yours. I'm in a motel room. I'm not drinking just coffee. I'm drinking tea. It's kind of cold. I just spent an hour and a half with Tom Sharpling. We just recorded another Mark and Tom show. That should be uh, forthcoming. We'll get that out to you soon. We had the, you know, our standard somewhat midlife chats about this and that uh but uh very few people make me laugh as much as tom sharpling i don't know if you listen to the best show but you should listen to it he's one of the great broadcasters very funny and we have fun together so look forward to that i just got here yesterday to new york city from albuquerque new mexico where i spent a few days i'd like to thank everyone who came out to the big benefit for endorphin power company at the uh a Hispanic Cultural Center at the Albuquerque Journal Theater there in my hometown. It was a spectacular show. I had a great time for a good cause. Saw a lot of uh, people that I haven't seen in a while. Very, It's very wild, man. It's very wild to not be part of people's lives for decades 
but having had them in your life at a, for a short period of time at another point in your history. And I, I've always had a hard time wrapping my brain around that, around, you know, seeing people. Because you have these very strong connections. Like I saw right when I got to Albuquerque, I went to uh, Duran's Pharmacy for some carne adovada. And um, I was uh, just sitting there at the counter, and there's some middle-aged dude at the other end of the counter, just a stout little dude, and he's looking at me, and I got no idea. I'm not I'm not connecting it. I'm not seeing nothing. I thought maybe he recognized me or whatever, so I'm sitting there. He gets up, walks over, and he's like, hey, Mark, man, you remember me? It's me, John. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, holy shit. It's John, the guy who lived across the street from me, whose house, you know, who, I got stoned with him in his tree house. One of the first times I got really stoned. And I've told this story before. But it was one of those great moments of bad parenting that probably led me to where I am now. But nonetheless, I couldn't, I could barely see John in this guy. Because a lot of times people put it different ways. Like, I mean, Tom Shaw used to do a bit about seeing the person that you used to know inside the person you're talking to. They're just surrounded by more face but it almost looks like these people have eaten the person you knew in high school and they've grown from within them, inside of them. Whatever the case, you kind of see who the person was. And I, I recognized him once he said who it was, but, you know, he did have this awkward sort of stonery laugh that, you know, he kind of interjected nervously after almost each sentence. And I'm like, that's the John I know. There's that, and like, hey, man, it's me, John. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, there you are. There you are. But yeah, he was the guy. I went over to his house and we went up his tree house, got really stoned. I freaked out. I went home to my house. I walked in. My mother was on to it. She said, are you stoned? And I go, yes, I'm stoned. And she goes, well, why don't you go to your room and play guitar? They say you play better when you're like that. They, she didn't really have the hang of punishing. But I appreciate that. Because, I mean, that kind of creative support is what uh, sent me wandering throughout the world aimlessly to define myself in a creative way. And that's why I ended up here, because my mom sent me to my room high to play guitar. Hey, are you running your business over email or using chat software? Or worst of all, having a bunch of meetings? No wonder you're losing your mind. That's the hard way. Switch away from that chaos and try Basecamp instead. Version 3 is all new and the best version yet. No more he said, she said. No more wait, I never saw that. No more, huh? How was I supposed to know? None of that. Done with that. Basecamp organizes all your projects and communication in one place so you have a central source of truth. With Basecamp, people know what they need to do. They know where things are and everyone's accountable. It's especially great for client projects or internal collaboration. Companies of all sizes love it. Teams say they couldn't live without it. We used it when we were collaborating with the team that redesigned WTFPod.com. You really need to try it for yourself. Sign up today for a free trial at Basecamp.com slash WTF. You'll pick it up in like a few minutes. Then you just add your team and get going. Remember, go to Basecamp.com slash WTF and then start your free trial. All right? Carnegie Hall, November 4th. That's happening. Uh, tickets are going fast. I would get them if I were you. I will be in Rochester, New York, uh, at uh, the Comedy Club tomorrow night and Saturday night, uh, 9th and 10th, four shows. I think one or two is sold out, but I think there's still tickets available. The Wilbur, September 24th, two shows. That's happening. There might be some tickets for that second show. I believe there are. Largo in Los Angeles, October 22nd. Uh, Carnegie Hall, I already mentioned that. Anyway, Billy Crystal is here today, and the reason I, I didn't know if I could get Billy Crystal on the show, I didn't know that Billy Crystal would want to be on the show necessarily, and I was at the uh, very sad but very uplifting and provocative uh, memorial service for Gary Shandling, and I was talking to uh, Rob Reiner, who I'd had on the show, and he was standing there with Billy Crystal, and uh, and I, we were talking about Rob doing the show, and I look at Billy Crystal, and I'm like, would you ever do the show? And he was sort of like... Um, yeah, of course I would do the show. He 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 was kind of had that vibe of sort of like, why am I not on the show? Why are you talking to Rob about the show? Why are you asking Rob Reiner to do the show and not me? And it was one of those moments like, I just never thought you would do the show. You would do, and he's like, yes, of course I'd love to do the show. So that's how that happened. So that's what Bill, Billy Crystal. That's that's how it happened. I didn't think he would do it. 
and then he said he would want to do it. Hey, are you, are you, are you, do you wear underwear every day? At least, I mean, most of us do. Now it's time to try something better. Me Undies has created the world's most comfortable underwear with a blend of fabric that is three times softer than cotton. This is a big time upgrade, friends. And when you upgrade your Undies game, everyone wins. Life feels better in Me Undies. That special fabric blend is called Modal. And it may be a funny word to say, but you won't be laughing when you feel it on your special parts. You know, those parts. You'll be feeling great. Me Undies has tons of colors and patterns from classic to bold to adventurous. Who doesn't want adventurous underpants? And it's the only brand that has matching pairs for men and women. But d- dual adventures. You could be an adventurous underwear duo. All orders in the U.S. and Canada ship for free if you don't love your first pair, and you will. Me Undies will pay you back, and you can keep it for free. No questions asked. If you love them as much as I think you will, you might even get a monthly subscription. For a limited time, Me Undies is offering you 20% off your first order at MeUndies.com slash WTF. Remember, if you don't love your first pair, it's free. Make sure you go to MeUndies.com slash WTF to get 20% off your first order and use my link so they know we sent you dig it underpants god it's so pretty in new york right now i used to live here but now i just like being here for maybe three or four days you get grimy you eat good food you get exhausted and then you go away back to the cat ranch all right what do you say we spend some time with billy crystal who just uh got back from a big tour of australia and new zealand And he's in the process of uh, bringing that show that he did there to America. So look out for that in the near future. This is me and Billy Crystal in the garage back in L.A. I sort of fall in and out of love with stand-up. Well, that, well, that's weird because, like, I it, well, when you started, when you were at Tish, was where you went, right? Yeah. When did you start stand up? Was it your first passion? Uh, it always was. But it was. That, yeah, it always was. I was from junior high school, high school, even earlier than that. I was yeah. always the guy, elementary school off book. Yeah, I, I just would, you know. Yeah, I would. I was always able to improvise in front of people. And who were your comics that when you were a kid you were listening to? Because in my mind, you're part of a a, a very important tradition. Well. The great, you know, because we had great television comics on, t- you know, the 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 real kind of yeah. heavy, heavy lifters, you know, Phil Silver, Sid Caesar, yeah, right, and that. But S- F- uh, Sid's voice was really the voice of Neil Simon, yeah, and Mel, yeah, and Danny and, Simon, and Danny Simon, yeah. and, and and Larry Gelbart, rest right. his soul, amazing guy, yeah. So that filtered through. There was a. Um, there was an ethnicity to what Sid did in a, in a very kind of subtle way that was fantastic to latch on to. Yeah. Um, ethnicity being Jewish? Yeah. The, but, yeah. The, but it wasn't overt. It wasn't the Borscht right, Belt. Right, I was right. not a Borscht Belt guy at all. Right. Um, More physical. Yeah. Yeah. And sketches. And yeah. Character. Right. Um, the, the guys that Sid did were like, you know, Progress Hornsby was a stone jazz musician and my... I knew the real guys, you know, because my dad was in the music business. Wait, and- what was he in the music business? Like, you know, I mean, because he was a real guy, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what did he do? Well, my family owned a little record store on 42nd Street in New York, between Lexington and 3rd, called the Commodore Music Shop. And it was the center of jazz from the late 30s all the way up to when it closed in the late 50s. So, the important time. Like, yeah. the, uh, coming out of swing yeah. into uh, the new jazz. Yeah. And the new jazz was really created on record by my uncle, who's a legendary producer named Milt Gabler. Uh-huh. Now, Milt um, turned my grandfather into a sort of an entrepreneur. So it was a music store where they sold radios and light bulbs and cranky people would come in. And, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. What aisle are the socks in? Are there socks? Where are the whisk brooms? <laughs> <laughs> and so then he said, Dad, yeah, he was like working there after high school. So he, he took one of the speakers of the radio and put it over the transom of the door and right on 42nd Street mm-hmm. and tuned it into this jazz station. It plays a lot of big Spiderback stuff. Yeah. And so the jazz was blasting out in the street. Yeah. People come and go, and, do you sell records here too? And they didn't. And my uncle said, well, we should sell records. Right. So they started buying up old records from like, um, uh, what was it? OK, OK, E-H OK, records. yeah, E-H, yeah. And reissuing them. Uh-huh. So then they created their own little label called the Commodore Jazz Label. Of course, it was right down the street from the Commodore Hotel. Okay. On 42nd Street. Yeah. Which is now, I think, the Grand Hyatt or something. Right. Right, right near uh, Grand Central I remember Station. Colony Records. Yeah. That was a big music On Broadway. Show yeah. yeah. But this little hole in the wall, it was like 
nine feet wide. Right. Now becomes this. The, everyone's wants these records. So then my uncle says to his father, "Pop, why are we why are we selling other people's records? Let's make our own." Right. And he he starts producing jazz records and jazz concerts all over the all over. Like the who city. are the guys? Oh my God! There is Eddie Condon, who was one of the great jazz guitar players yeah. of all time. Pee Wee Russell. Yeah. Um, and that later evolved into Billie Holiday, and Billie did all of her original great records on the Commodore Jazz with label. your uncle. Yeah, which included Strange Fruit. And, that and was, how old were you with this? I was not thought of until oh, okay. like, I, I come along in 1948. Right. Or, or on my ND page, my MD page uh, 1957. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so my dad then marries into the family and takes over the store. Milt splits, goes to Decca Records. Oh, this is your mother's side of the family? Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. okay. So my mother's big brother was right, Milt. Right, right. Milt splits the Decca Records. We has a 35 gold record career, including Rock Around the Clock, Red Roses for Blue Lady, Volare. Were you close with him? Oh, yeah. He was a mentor to me. So he was around. Oh, God, they all were. In New York. You're yeah. Like Milt all, only worked from New York. So yeah. he's producing all that stuff, yeah, Rock Around he, the Clock. Yeah, but then he'd, go, he'd fly to Germany. He was like the celebrity, you yeah. know, and I would like sit at his feet because <laughs> he did Sammy Davis's first gold record, which was... Um, hey there, yeah. you with the stars in your eyes. That was from Pajama Game. So he talked to me about Sammy and said, watch him. He does a lot of things. Do a lot of things. Because he knew I had the shining. You know, he knew right, right, I right. He wanted, he wanted to be show business. So you're a kid, yeah. like what, 12, 11? Oh, younger than that. Oh, Five, and you're six. going to shows and, you oh, meet, yeah. and yeah. you're meeting everybody. So you feel that... That show business thing, like the backstage thing. Well, then like, my oh, dad's okay. producing jazz concerts yeah. all over New York besides running the store. Yeah. So now, in order to be with him, and this is sort of was the basis of 700 Sundays, was uh, we'd go to the clubs with him to yeah. just to, you know, be with him. Right. Because weekends, you know, it was Friday, Saturday night till 3 o'clock in the morning. And he's hanging out with these, these are heavy cats. Uh, amazing, the greatest guys. Fats Waller, uh, Willie the Lion Smith, uh, Jack Teagarden, uh, Pee Wee Russell, did you, did you Henry dad, Red dad, Allen. Oh, you know, yeah. Did yeah. your dad drink? No, no. So he was just a witness. Yeah, well, he also emceed the shows. Okay. And that was another thrill, because my dad's on stage behind a, you know, behind a microphone and a spotlight. It was, and you know, in the, yeah, in yeah. A, in a shiny suit. It was, was he like, funny? Was cool, yeah, very witty guy. He was? Yeah, very witty guy. And your mom? Was she- my mom was uh, this, the lifeblood of the family in that they were a remarkable pair. He was quiet and really witty. Great sense of humor. Turned yeah. us on to, in television, it was not the Three Stooges, it was Laurel and Hardy. Right. It was Ernie Kovacs. Yeah, it's yeah. okay if you stay up late. Uh, I know you got a fourth grade test yeah. tomorrow. Right. Watch Kovacs. Just watch the highbrow shit. Watch <laughs> what Phil Silvers does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big Phil Silvers fan. And and it was a great influence. I had two older brothers, all very funny. They around? Yeah. That's and, good. And, um, yeah, and we, like, we would steal from everybody. Sure. So we were the Nairobi trio. Do impressions. Yeah, we were yeah. the Ni- Nairobi trio. From Ernie Kovacs? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, and we were the 2,000-year-old. When that album came out, forget about it. The, How old were you when that came out? Uh, I was 12. Those are my baseball cards, Mark. Mel Brooks, did that album came out when you were 12? 1960. No kidding. Those are my baseball cards. Yeah, right. Those were, you know, you know, I love the music. I still love the jazz. But the, the comedy albums that Dad would bring home from the store, that was on my baseball cards. Right. That was, you know... That was a g- g- amazing albums. It felt like Jonathan Winters had an album out every month. Shelley Berman, and, yeah, and uh, Nichols and May, right on Broadway. Yeah, yeah. Um, Did he like any of the those Yiddish guys, like Myron Cohen or anything? He of always those? left to Myron Cohen, but you know, because Myron Cohen, all of those guys, <laughs> yeah, yeah, were really artists. Right. They were so so specific in who they were mm-hmm. and who they played to. Yeah, and that's when the Catskills was at its height. Yeah. Did you guys go up there? Only once. Only once. <laughs> that was enough? That was enough. Happened? Well, we didn't have any money. We were uh, in the jazz business. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that's where I saw my first comedian, which, you know, watching this guy's act. Who? Uh, I, I think his name was Pat Henry. Uh-huh. And uh, he was a bald guy, and he, he said, I, I grew my eyebrows really long so I could sweep them back over my head. Uh-huh. It was the stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And then, of course, every Sunday night, uh, in addition to the, uh, the guys during the week was at Sullivan. Sullivan had a comic on every Sunday Did night. you ever go to the show? No, but the comics were the heavy All hitter guys yeah. and and the novelty acts. Yeah. I loved the novelty Plate acts. Plate spinners? The, yeah, but there was the, well, the guy- There's the, usually the, nine of them, weren't yeah, there? The, the novelty the, acts? The, the, the Lady of Spain guy. Yeah. And the Weir Brothers uh-huh. were, you should watch them. Yeah. G- Google the Weir Brothers yeah. folks who never listen. <laughs> They they was I think they were Swedish or Norwegian. 
three guys <laughs> with a one had to play clarinet, one played guitar, one played violin or bass, yeah. and they were hilarious <laughs> physical. These were music hall performers. Well, that's interesting about like about. I was talking to a friend of mine about uh, about you and and your style that your physicality and your sense of physical timing is so. Uh, uh, right on. Like, you know, it's a natural thing, but you're aware of it. Yeah. And, and like, uh, and I've always envied it because it, it, it is a natural thing. And, and once you learn how to do it, I imagine it's sort of addictive, but there is a moment where, you know, to, to do takes, to do beats, to do physical stuff. Yeah. It's a choice, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, when you're in front of an audience, it helps them see the joke if they don't hear it. Right, right, you right. You know what I mean? Yeah, but there's also that amazing <laughs> beats that those guys took, like those pauses and the takes. You know, like you know, and and not many guys do it anymore. You no. know, it's a lost art. But like when I watch, you know, like analyze this. I guess I'm getting off the narrative, but it's I, okay. <laughs> it's the narrative. <laughs> <laughs> when. uh because like there's a, there's a few scenes in analyze this where where I can watch them over and over again and your reaction is so fucking classic and so <laughs> hilarious that I like that scene where the the him I don't know that with the hugging hey him I don't know oh what, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I laugh thinking about it but 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 like you were so uh, you you were onto that but it wasn't it didn't come unresearched in a way no no and I, but also it was a pretty natural thing for me yeah. It was a pretty natural thing for me. Yeah. Um, when you grow up with aunts and uncles who were very animated. And in a very Jewish ethnic way. Yes. Very specific. Yeah, but it, it wasn't this kind of way. Right. It wasn't that. There must have been one of those. There, there, were, there were 12 of them. <laughs> but my apostles. Yeah. But they, everyone was very animated. They, yeah. they speak with their hands. Yeah, yeah. And, Sure. And a lot of times they were, they, they was, their hands were covered with salad dressing or, 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 or macaroni salad or something, which is not attractive when they speak Yiddish. Right. Um, Did you grow up with Yiddish? Uh, Russian. Really? Russian. For who, yeah. your grandmother? Yeah, yeah, both in Russian. And, and, and a lot of Yiddish after a while when they didn't want us to know what they were talking exactly. about. Exactly. That's what my grandparents did. Yeah. Like, what are they doing? Yeah. What's this gibberish? And oh, they're they, going to the movies. They'd catch you out of the corner of their eye. So Max said to me, <laughs> and you wouldn't you knew that there was something you didn't they didn't want you to hear yeah <laughs> what did you really just say something no <laughs> oh, i was hoping you did you know what's so funny what? about you know listen i i <laughs> i'm i love my religion i love the, yeah. the world i was born into right. i'm not the most religious guy in the sure. world but i love the heritage of it yeah i, I love um the things that it stands for and i've been very open about it People will come up to me, yeah, <laughs> and it always makes me either laugh or get annoyed. Yeah, when they'll go a total stranger. Yeah, so Billy, how are you? What are you doing? Yeah. And I'll go, why are you talking like that? The guy goes, oh, well, I, I, I thought you might like that. I said, no, no, I don't. It's almost, it's almost anti-Semitic. <laughs> they see you as a cultural representative of, know, of the Jewish type. They see me, and suddenly I'm in like a talus and a yarmulke. <laughs> And the and the black hat and the you know the Billy so much the Yankees got enough pitching. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think they like they're trying to connect. Yes, they are. And <laughs> I, I I do I I get it. It just right. it always baffles me. But the funny thing is, is you're familiar with that character. Yeah, you know oh, you sure. grew up with that. Like it's because like I I didn't you know like my, my grandparents were from Jersey and everything. And I grew up with that Jewish thing, and I've always been a fan of that comedy. And it's definitely in me. Yeah. You know, I I somehow like for years I fought against it. Yeah. So like I I wouldn't even mention I was a Jew on stage because right. I like I didn't know how to do it it without going like, you know how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Is there another way to do the Jew thing? No. And I I wasn't doing it. No. I went, in my early stuff. I didn't do it. I started doing it on soap. Uh huh. The last year of soap. Susan Harrison, uh, uh, who's an amazing writer, um, who created the show, brought on a young writer named Stu Silver. Mm -hmm. Did you ever know Stu? No. Uh, Stu was a great c comedy writer. A, a fascinating story. As as stereotypical Jewish comedy writer as you can imagine, yeah. except he was a young guy. Right. I know guys like that. There, a, there are guys that are just born old men. Yes. They're born a, old Jews. And he was a delightful guy. Yeah. And we came up with a with a storyline that my character Jody goes into hypnotherapy to figure out why he's attracted to women and so on. And it and he's confused. I kinda remember so, this. Yeah. And he he takes me back in time. It was sort of like the search for Bridie Murphy. I remember I remember and I, be, and I become this old Jewish right, right, guy right. in my past yeah. and I'm stuck. I can't get out of 
this guy. So here I am looking like I looked back in 1980. Yeah. yeah. But I, I talk like this, and I'm talking to my mother, Mary Campbell, and I'm teaching her about how God tests. God will test people. My first wife, I remember the lines. Yeah. Franya, a redhead. Yeah. She was... um raped by the Cossacks repeatedly. <laughs> but since she looked like a pumpernickel bread, it was more of a test for the Cossacks. This, <laughs> and it's, and then I started doing it. I started put, filtering into my stand-up, yeah. which I was doing like you know a lot of them. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, so that's where it sort of started. But it's so sort of, funny because it's like it's somehow ingrained in us I, I you know I, I i talked to like like i talked to jeff goldblum the other day and it, it's it's somewhere in us it's our yeah. history and in, in like those those people are stereotypical or their characters but i had one there there was a woman my my grandmother's aunt used to sit in the, she didn't speak any english and they had to make her kosher food yeah. and she would sit on a on a plastic covered sofa <laughs> and eat by herself at yeah. family events i mean it's just part of the thing yeah oh yeah the it's eastern a, european jew thing yeah it's a it's a it's a brush stroke it's it's um and it shouldn't be denied because they were they were really kind of amazing people oh yeah and the language of comedy for years yeah was, oh, for was, sure. was the the timing of it the timing the emphasis the the lean in <laughs> I adored Alan King. We, did you? Yeah. We became great friends. We did a movie together um, uh, where we played father and son. It's a very sweet movie called Memories of Me. And we became very close. Uh, and I would I would imitate him to him. Uh-huh. Not doing his voice, but uh-huh. just the lean in. Yeah. Because they want to make sure you hear them. Yeah. But he did it on the Sullivan show. Yeah. But folks, you can't see me, but I'm going to lean into yeah. the mic. It may get a little loud. Yeah. So this is no punchline. This is just so. Uh, what am I doing about that crabgrass? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they lean right towards you. Yeah. You almost, if you're in the first row, you just want to like settle back just a little bit. Well, it's that's interesting. Like a 3D movie, right? Well, that's interesting. That's crabgrass because he was really the first of the the Jewish comics to do the middle class Jewish thing. That you know, like we're not, you know, we're not shtetl people. Right. You know, we're not pushing racks of clothes now. We're 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 in we're on Long Island. Well, he was, and he was very wealthy. Yeah. Alan was. Different than the other um, uh, comics uh, of that time, he produced mm-hmm. um, uh, Broadway plays, movies, The Line in Winter. Yeah. He had great taste. He mm-hmm. was on the board of directors of Shenley, and he had this house Yeah, that was Oscar Hammerstein's house in Great Neck. <laughs> yeah, Great Neck. And it was beautiful. It's right on the Long Island Sound. Yeah. And he, I know he had a huge ego. He bought it because it was on King's Point. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's what it was called, King's Point, <laughs> and he was Alan King. <laughs> and we, when my friends, I was the youngest of my graduating class. I didn't have a driver's license. So my From where, high college. school? Yeah. We would drive to Alan King's house in Great Neck and yeah. look over the fence yeah. and see the Rolls Royce, uh-huh. the beautiful Tudor house. Yeah. And it was like, I, I would love to have that someday. <laughs> he had, well, we would whisper, he, he's a comedian. And look what he has. Yeah. He can have a house like that. And then he came, when I was little, he came into an Italian restaurant yeah. in my hometown, yeah, um, which was Long Beach, Long Island. Yeah. And there was a hotel that had a big showroom, uh-huh. and everybody worked there. Sammy, I saw yeah. Sammy Davis Jr. there, and I the bust. dinner club, right? Was it, yeah, yeah, it was a big hotel and yeah. a big supper club. Yeah, and Alan came into this little restaurant, and we actually wrote this into uh, Mr. Saturday Night. Where Ron Silver playing the director tells me of the entrance he saw me make uh-huh. in a restaurant. Right. And Alan, ha- he had just come from the show. Yeah. He had a mohair suit on, a white shirt, beautiful white tie, like yeah. white on white. Uh-huh. I must have been nine. Yeah. <laughs> and he came in and everybody applauded. And he like glided into the room. And I had recognized him from the Sullivan show. Right. And, you know, we were very modest people. Sunday night was the one that we could eat out. Yeah. And I saw him and I ran up to him and I said, Mr. King, I think you're fantastic. And he looked at me and he said, whoa, look what just fell out of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought it was like getting an autograph from Mickey Mantle. It was like he insulted me. It was like so great. And we put that into the, into the, into the, into the movie. You yeah, know? With no malice. Though. No, uh, no, uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Alan was amazing. There, yeah. I'm so blessed to 
you know, that's one of the fringe benefits, Mark, of what we do. If yeah. You, you know, my grandfather used to say, if you hang around long enough, sooner or later they'll give you stuff. Yeah. Um, the people we get to meet yeah. and end up with. Yeah, yeah. And become part of their lives is, is for me, at this point in my life, in my career, kind of, I look back and smile going, holy shit. Right. Holy shit. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. wild. I mean, you know. What, when did you like what like so so you're nine you're watching Sullivan you're doing all this stuff you're doing shtick in, in school and your brothers did, did they end up in show business in any way my middle brother um he's I'm the youngest he's yeah. two years older uh, my brother Rip has been a producer a television producer for years out here yeah and um and my older brother Joe was a um, art teacher for thirty six years really funny great witty guy. Um, and he's retired now. Uh huh. Yeah. So you, so you have a creative family. You have a family yeah. that's open minded, at least enjoy show business. Oh, big time and big civil show. rights people. And and, yeah. and and on top of that, my mom was a great tap dancer. Oh yeah. And if, uh, she was the voice of Minnie Mouse in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parades in the late thirties. <laughs> she would sit in the float as it came down <laughs> and would sing. So this uh, you, it would usually I'm forever blowing bubbles. Uh huh. Um, to this huge float, yeah, coming down inside the float. Yeah, inside the float. There was a, like a little cabin or whatever at the base of Minnie's feet, and no one would see her. And there'd be a piano, a little piano, and she'd sing. I think that's so fun. Yeah, because there's something that keeps sticking with me is that, like, even in Mr. Saturday Night, and, and because of the way you were brought up, that weird difference between the show person. And backstage yeah. or in the float, like you know that, like you, to really appreciate that, you, you, which it sounds like you must have, because you're sitting there, you, you're going to your, these gigs with your father, yeah. and you're seeing these jazz guys, and they're just sitting around smoking, yeah. you know, before the show or doing whatever, and then they go on. It's like, all right, I'm on. You know, there's a, there's a weird kind of like the appreciation for show business when you feel that. Yes, and not only that, there's a. Um, <clears throat> The word destiny yeah. is is different than fate. Right. Destiny is more important. Uh huh. Um, fate is like by chance. Right. Right. Destiny means it was meant to be. Sure. And when I think about getting up on stage in front of seven hundred people when I was five years old and tap dancing to right. you know this uh, uh, Conrad Janis and the Tailgaters, uh -huh. a great Dixieland band, not having any fear. Um, just wanting to be up there, yeah. moth to the flame, you yeah. know, yeah. and being uh, endorsed and and supported by my folks. Um, it wasn't like, Dude, why did you go up there? Don't you? Right. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. They loved it. Yeah, and it's not nobody pushed me. I, they just knew that I had to sort of do this. Yeah. I was sort of like, I was a ranger. Yeah. I was ranger in the back of my, in my house, <laughs> writing jokes, the, watching <laughs> comics, loving it. Couldn't wait to get up on stage. You love it. Love them. I still do. But I, I like that idea, like the idea of that loving it, you, you know, because I, you know, I just personally, and obviously we're, we're different people and have different careers, but, you know, I sort of like, I needed to be a comic because I had something to say. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, so taking the love, I, yeah, I would fight it. You know, I, I was that kind of comic where, you know, I'm going to, it's going to be a little tough at first for us. But <laughs> <laughs> you may not love me right yeah, away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but you like just, you just took it you, and you felt it and it was great. <laughs> I, yes. But I also, I also had um, a little mantra. Yeah. Which was don't settle in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know stay, I mean? stay vigilant. Yes, yes. Don't get too <laughs> relaxed, man. It's uh, I, mine used to be hide the hate. Well, <laughs> that's, that's a little more uh, it is dramatic. Yeah, Similar, little, I think. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> hide the hate. That's a great album title. <laughs> Yeah, or a book title. Yeah, I, all right. I'm, I'll make note of it. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, because I like I, I realized that you know in the last few years, like I miss you as uh, the host of the Oscars because oh. because you love show business. I do. <laughs> you know, you you know, it's like this is a night for show business. Celebrate show business, you fuck. Yeah, whoever you fuck is. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I, I I never thought I'd have a moment. Where I'm like I miss Billy dancing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but but the did. thing is, I didn't really dance. I no, did, but you I, did. I, you I, moved. I did. Yeah, oh, I moved, for sure. And <laughs> yeah. we entertained. Right. You know, because that's, entertain. what it was, that's what it was about. It was, just, yeah, because that's what it is about. It's it is supposed about to be. That. Everybody knows too much now. And I'm not even that old <laughs> to say that. No, it's true. And, and, you know, social media really hurts that a lot. Sometimes, yeah. It's yeah. like everybody's it's on much. this equal playing field. It's like, no, I, I, we're, I, no. no. I want some privacy. I'd like the mystery to be maintained a bit, if possible. Yes, and I don't need to hear from Jack 59 in whatever town it is that he hates me. Yeah. Because Alan had a king had yeah. a great line about that, which was um, surrounded by assassins. <laughs> but he was talking about other comics. <laughs> maybe. 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 <laughs> So when did you when did you decide to sort of pursue it like in earnest like to, to, like how did that when I got out of the draft uh huh um, sixty nine uh, yeah the first draft first yeah. televised draft uh huh um, I was a f film I was a directing major at NYU um, studying film direct I don't really I still don't right. know why I did that I swear to God I had been in nothing but musicals and 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 play in high school in high school and college. Um, oh, you went to college. This is the graduate school you're talking it, no, about. No, I went. I went two years. I went to a school in West Virginia. Yeah. Uh, West Virginia first, called Marshall University. How was that? It was well. I went one year. <laughs> um, I, I had a good time. Yeah. I was uh, I was a baseball player, and it didn't work out for me there. And I transferred. Is that what you wanted to do? Yeah, and I, I came home. My father just passed away. Um, I, I was I young. Was, huh? I was very yeah, fifty four. Oh. I was fifteen, so I was very. I, I was really depressed, and I I would go away, and West Virginia was a little too off Broadway for me. Yeah, and I was lonely, and a you're city I kid. I, yeah, and I didn't give it the best chance I could give it. I think, and you're in grief, and it's, yeah, you're and alone it, now. You, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. first time away from home, and, oh. you know, and I was seventeen. I couldn't Must even horrible. And I couldn't even drink. I couldn't even drink with the guys and do any stuff like that. So I I, I came home that summer. And I had a job in a in a day camp, uh huh. Jewish day camp? No, regular. Yeah. And um, this girl walks by. I'm on a I'm on a beach playing ball with this yeah. friend, uh, Stevie Cohut. Yeah. And uh, I'm getting ready for go back to school. So, and she walks by, and I said, "I'm going to marry her," <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so four years later and so i didn't go back to school uh -huh. i transferred to this junior college to be around her yeah uh -huh. I, I knew if it was i loved her so much right away yeah that you know i don't know if you've ever been in like a long distance relationship sure they don't work out no it's easier now with skype but yeah. no but back then difficult yeah and so i said not gonna go back yeah and i got into i transferred this great junior college called Nassau Community College and had one elective uh -huh. which was an acting 101 program yeah. and I walked in there and it was like I'm home no kidding yeah great teacher you remember the guy Ed, his name was George Oliver uh -huh. um, interesting man I loved the students started doing stuff started doing scenes started doing and I just gave it for two years that's all I did yes yeah. then I transfer no stand up yet uh, no. Yeah. But I, f I met these two guys who were actors, and we started doing improvs together. Uh-huh. I would have just done stand-up, yeah. but I was terrified. Right. So I had these two guys, and we had this really fun act. Who were those guys? There's Dave Hawthorne and, and Al Finelli. Uh-huh. And we became known as We the People, uh -huh. and then we became known as Three's Company. We had more names than really good sure. routines. Yeah. <laughs> which was two. <laughs> yeah. So now I transfer to NYU, and I get in. I don't know why, Mark. I applied as a directing major. I didn't go into the acting program. You don't know why. I st I still don't know why. You know, I used to make little home movies and stuff, you right. know, and I loved. I like being. A, Did you think maybe it was a better job? I thought maybe I was very practical. Right. That if the acting thing didn't work out, I had something yeah. solid like directing yeah. to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I get to NYU. Yeah. And who's my my film professor of of, of the uh, you know production class? A graduate student named Martin Scorsese. No kidding. Yeah. So this is what seventy what? This is sixty eight. Sixty eight. Sixty eight. I'm living in the East Village with my best friend David Sherman. We're still the closest of friends, and um, we had this little apartment on East Fifth Street. Next to the police station, and the reason the police station is as important, it was on the wide shot of the police station on Kojak. Uh huh. You can see my apartment. Oh yeah. <laughs> And he pointed to that a lot. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Right here. And, you know, you show me Miles Davis records. Miles would get busted every week. 
<laughs> because he'd be coming down to the Lower East Side to look for the drugs. Score, yeah. Yeah, and his red Ferrari would be out front of yeah. our apartment building. Right. And he'd be yelling at this red-haired detective named Sergeant Fink. Uh-huh. And he'd be yelling at him, Motherfucker! Why do you keep fucking fuck? Get me the fuck! And he said, Miles, don't be coming down here no more. Don't be coming down looking for drugs. What are you, stupid? What are you, stupid? You saw don't this? My- oh, yeah, we'd see him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then, so that was um, sixty-eight, nine, and seventy. Uh, now, Sixth Street, uh, East Fifth, East Fifth between three twenty-five East Fifth Street between, between first and first second. and second. Yeah. <clears throat> and now, Vietnam's raging. It was the greatest place to live. Was the East Village then? It was so extraordinary. Um, the Fillmore East was there. Uh, was so, that third? Fourth no, there's right on Sixth Street and Second Avenue. Yeah. I lived on Second between A and B in the eighties. Right. Yeah. And it was right next door. That's yeah. why I saw my first movie. Was that theater? My dad did these concerts at a place called the Central Plaza, which was one eleven Second Avenue, uh-huh. which is now an NYU building. Right. Right. Is that the film archive? Wait, wait, uh, it was a movie theater. It was a movie theater called, yeah, originally it was called the Lowe's Commodore, ironically, huh. had the Commodore name in it. Yeah, yeah. And it became the Fillmore East. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh-huh. that's where, you know, everybody played. Oh, everybody. Oh, yeah. it was amazing. That, but for the Great whole, Hendrix, the Band of Gypsies record. Yeah, Zappa, everybody yeah. played. And um, the East Village then was so exciting to be part of, but our country at that point, was in the middle of natural childbirth. Yeah. It was all the screaming, all yeah. this yelling. Yeah. Um, we hated this, this war. We hated Nixon. We hated what was happening. Um, and I mean, LBJ knew what he was doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I will not seek nor will I accept a nomination. I'm getting the fuck out of here. Because <laughs> yeah. he could see what was happening. Uh huh. And now we're faced with this. And suddenly, you know, c- kids today have no, and now I sound like I. And you're like 20? Uh, let's see. I said, yeah, I was just, I was, uh, yeah, 20. Yeah. Um, uh, now with, um, sound yeah. like Alan King. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. kid, but yeah. nobody today, were you exposed to the draft? No, no, I'm 52. Oh, so there yeah. was, you, you got a selective service card. Yeah. And they told, they told us that they're going to have, as the war was heating up. Yeah. That we're having this televised draft. Yeah. Which was a Powerball, basically. 365 <laughs> birthdays, ping pong balls. You didn't want, really? Put into a machine, live on television. And they, as they came out, if you were in the first 200, you were, you had a report right away, and you were more than likely were going to go to Vietnam. And listen, for those of us who didn't believe in the war, this was a terrifying thing. For those who made their choice, I re- totally respect that. I was... I had no idea why I cared about the M. Van Fu. I had, you know, I had yeah. no, I, I didn't, if they were, if they were in, if they were in Jersey, yeah. then okay, sign me up. Or if they were bombing Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then sign me right. up. Right. But I didn't, what would, what did we care about that? Right. It made no sense to us. Much like this word that we've been in for t- yeah. 12 years now doesn't make any sense either. 15 right. years. Yeah. Um, so it was on television. Sure. So, so it was like the it was like the anti lottery. Yeah, you, you didn't want to win. No, right. <laughs> First two hundred, you're gone. Yeah. So I had this production class, right? This television production class, right? This at NYU. Yeah. So the, I think it came on at seven or eight o'clock, whatever it was, and we were able to watch like the first fifty names. I'm not in the first fifty boys. Yeah. The tension, you know, it spins, spins, and the ball comes out. April third. So and it was just birthdays. Just birthdays. April 3rd, next one, you know, yeah. March 2nd, yeah. August, can you imagine your life is being decided by some guy in a uniform uh-huh. pulling his balls out mm-hmm. of a machine? It no was, music to this. No. <laughs> we'll be right back with the draft. <laughs> it yeah. was terrifying. Yeah. So now I'm not in the first 50. All right. I got a chance here. Yeah. And I run home and I run to the place on, on 8th Street. Called the Gem Spa. Remember the Gem Spa on Second Avenue? Oh wait, wait. They have the uh, egg creams. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and those little uh, chocolate raspberry things. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Well, look, when you were stoned, that's where you wanted to go. No, I, I, I think it's still there. It's, yeah, it is there. Yeah, they make the egg creams. Yeah. There. So I run up there. I yeah. run across town from from uh, Washington Square Park uh-huh. 
thinking I'm not in the first 50. I'm not in the first 50. How many balls have been pulled since that? I left, you know? Yeah. The New York Times hits the pavement. I mean, it was like, it was like a Scorsese cut of a yeah. movie. Boom! I'm like, and that, that, up to 112. Still not by the time they went to print. No! I run back to my apartment, run up the stairs. I, my, and I call my mother, Mom, are you watching a lot of me? No, dear, there's a, a Bonanza has a two hour a special. Hoss got bit by a snake and he, he has a, oh, good, good, good. <laughs> Boom. Now I'm watching the Joe Franklin show, a guy I would end up imitating on SNL. <laughs> yeah. And one of the most, I think it was one of the first ticker tapes on television came through at the bottom with the numbers. So now I see I'm not in 112 to 175. Right. I'm not in 175 to 220. I'm yeah. not, I don't get called until 354. And that's how I got out of going into the army. So they literally went through the whole year? Yeah, three, yeah 365 days. And it was just the order? Yeah. So I was 354. I never had to take a physical. I never had anything like that. I was out. So You won the lottery. I won the lottery and went into show business with my two friends, Al and Dave. We formed this act. Yeah. And we started uh, doing improvs and fake improvs and sketches and stuff. At places? And Yeah. We started on a, on a, it was Iowa Vaudeville. Yeah. It was called the Coffee House Circuit. Yeah. And uh, we would we would get $150 each, but you'd be there three days. Yeah. And you'd live in a dorm. No kidding. Yeah. So you were traveling. You were traveling, yeah. So we were on the road in my little Volkswagen, usually. Um, not that it's a big Volkswagen. It was my Volkswagen and with Dave and Al. And we had a, we had a great time. What were those rooms? What were the rooms in New York that you would play? We or played, we... well, we, we ended up at the, the bitter end. Right. Which was great. There was, uh. In the context at that time, so you had the committee was around. There was a precedent for improv. Ace, Tru Ace Trunking Company. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Ace Trucking was really good. Fred Willard was in Ace yeah. Trucking. Yeah. Um, uh, the committee, um, uh, that was a more of a West Coast thing. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and we were really funny. We did it like a Mike Douglas show and we did, you know. You did? It, yeah, but it was, it was hard to break through with three guys. And I was there four and a half years with them. Really? So you were in that, le you were in show business? <laughs> I was in show business, yeah. yeah. And not making any money. I mean, right. the most I made was like, my four grand a year. Were you the feature act or the headline act? Or you We'd did... be the opening act. Right. And then sometimes we would headline. But it, at the colleges, we were always the featured act. Right. And it'd always be a folk singer. Sure. And us. And yeah. what they, you know, these, it was called the coffee house yeah. circuit. So right. So every campus on had a thing after eight yeah. o'clock that, Cafeteria became yeah right the the nightclub the beatniks yeah 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 and that's where we that's where we work huh. but I was already married uh, in 1970 wow so uh, for me you it gotta was, make a living yeah and I was so I was substitute teaching yeah um, at the school I went to mm -hmm. which was weird being on Long that, Island yeah in Long Beach in the junior high that's that, where you were living but yeah, yeah I was yeah I was living in in, um, in the house I grew up in upstairs it was like a separate oh, this after apartment. the Low East Side yeah so wait we didn't like we didn't linger on Scorsese so you got this like you know hyperactive graduate student teacher oh my god he would stand behind you and we were working you know there was film then yeah so you got white gloves on there was a machine called the moviola yeah the movie, right the yeah. moviola had the film on one spool and your sound on the other spool and you synced them up yeah and they'd run through a machine right and you couldn't touch with it you had white gloves and you, if you wanted to make an edit you'd stop with the brakes right. put a grease mark on your cut yeah. take a razor blade make the cut <laughs> yeah take the tape make the edit <laughs> Go to the sound, hear the sound. <laughs> Make the edit. <laughs> and so, and he'd stand behind you. Yeah. And he had this big beard. Yeah. And, um, why did you make that cut? I don't understand. Why would you do that? Why would you make that cut? Howard Hawks would make that cut. I said, Howard Hawks isn't a student here. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I see him, um, you know, I, I say I ask him the same question. Why did you give me a C? Yeah. <laughs> We're making little movies. <laughs> uh, but it was he was amazing. Yeah. You know. He do you was, have any of those movies? Do you remember? Did you? See I have them. You yeah. Do? How are they? They're basically silly. Uh huh. There was you know just. Uh, yeah. But did you feel like you learned something there? I did. I learned basics of um, 
uh, staging, uh-huh. um, so, uh, you know, the, the camera dictionary. Of the, of the actually directed. Yeah, yeah, yeah of where, who stands where and how you come around right, the side. Right, right, right. That, that basic stuff. Coverage. You yeah, know, yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're living on Long Island. You substitute teaching. Yeah. You're in a, 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 a three guy act. Right. And I'm and getting, to, I'm getting, you have weary. kid yet? Uh, 1973. Okay. So I'm getting weary. Yeah. And I'm getting anxious. Yeah. Because I know I'm hiding. Yeah. Hiding. <clears throat> so I, what do you mean? Like you, 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 you just, uh, you, you're protected by the other guys. Yeah. And you're not really going so, into the big game. And we, and we're, you know, it's lonely at the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we get, Noticed <clears throat> just by chance. Yeah, uh, we're up at uh, a record company called Buddha Records. Yeah, yeah, Kath Stevens, I think. Yeah, yeah. And we were trying to do an album. Mm-hmm. We were going to do a very because like Cheech and Chong's made a record already and yeah. it's big on college oh, yeah. radio, right? Yeah. And Uncle we're, Dirty, we're working. <laughs> you remember Bob, that guy, Bob Altman? Yeah, yeah. And we were working on this album with his two young producers there. And and we were, you know, we had a, we had, the act was good. Yeah. And we were auditioning for, to open for Sha Na Na. Mm hmm. Um, and we're doing our act, I swear, in a conference room, the three of us doing our beds for one guy. Yeah. And, uh, Ed Sommerfeld, I think his name Uh is. Uh huh. And he says, Do you guys know who Buddy Moore is? I go, no. He said, he's Robert Klein's manager. Uh huh. And they were the Jack Rollins, Charlie Joffe office, which was the, Sure. The best office. Sure. Because they had Woody Allen, yeah. Dick Cavett. And we said, I'm going to bring him in. Buddy Mora. Yeah. Yeah. So he brings him Buddy, and we do our stuff for him yeah. all alone in this room. Yeah. And he doesn't laugh. Sure. He smiles a couple of yeah. times and says, okay, um, let's see. Let me see what we can do. So and so. So he gets us in a couple little rooms in New York, so and so forth. And um, I know we're, it's not happening. But we're in the mix in this office a yeah. little bit. Right. He then, with uh, a great man who just sadly passed away, uh, Larry Bresner, uh, come to me and they say, have you ever thought about doing stand-up? Uh-huh. And I said, yes. Um, and I said, because the act isn't going anywhere. We don't think that it's... it's they just, pulled you aside. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But... We'll be there for you, and we'll work with you right from the beginning if this is what you want to do, because we think you could be a stand-up comic. Uh-huh. So I went, oh, my God. Yeah. And I said, let me think about this. Yeah. Now I know I have a support group. Right. A big one. Yeah. So I'm a home, and I was a I was Mr. Mom. Yeah. Janice went back to work. Yeah. Um, she's now working at the college that I went to. She's assistant dean of theater uh-huh. at, at NASA Community College. How'd you feel about that? I was, well, listen, it was what you had to do. Sure. And, you know. She had faith in you, though? Yes, because yeah. she's, this is one who said to me, you can do this. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go back to work. You figure this out. Uh-huh. And I'm I'm there for you. And we had a baby who was six months old, and she said, this is important for so you. So this is 73. Yeah. Yeah. So I get a call from a friend at NYU. Uh-huh. Um, his name is Iris Sardi, <laughs> yeah. and uh, he said, "Hey, listen, yeah, do you know do you know a comedian who could do like fifteen minutes in front of the folk singer at the ZBT house on Friday? We're having a party, and it's my dad's friend." Yeah. So yeah. I said, "Yeah, I'll do it." Yeah, first gig. He said, "Well, when, when did you start doing stand-up? Oh no, I've, I've been doing it for a while, <laughs> lying my ass off <laughs> as I'm feeding my baby. Yeah, and um, he said, well, "Yeah, oh, great. It's a uh, it's a uh, Friday night." Um, if you get there like at seven, go on at eight, eight fifteen, eight twenty, you're done. And then the folks are great, I, I, and it's like twenty five bucks. I went great, you yeah. know, like boom. <laughs> yeah. I hung up and I went, "What the hell did I just do?" Yeah. So I called up Buddy Moore. I said, "Buddy, listen, I, 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 I booked myself into a fraternity party. It's Friday night. Yeah. It's twenty five bucks, and I don't think I should pay you commission." <laughs> 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 he said, great, give me the information. So I said where it was. It was on Mercer Street. and So now I start putting together stuff. Yeah. And I threw this in. I threw that in. So I was doing um, Cosell and Ali a little bit with the act. Uh-huh. We used to do this Wide World of Sports thing. And yeah. I would do, so I had a, that. I had about two minutes. Yeah. Uh, maybe three. It's a couple other things I threw together. I, I did the Wizard of Oz in a minute. 
Uh-huh. The premise was the film's been on so much uh, television, it's all spliced up, and so it's, did you do that bit for years? Was that yeah, yeah, yeah? yeah. So I get to the fraternity. It's pouring rain. Yeah. It's like horrible out. Yeah. I get to the fraternity house. They were all sitting there and you know, you know, smoking pot and all this stuff. Yeah. And I see the stage and yeah. I'm like, I'm like panicked. I think I, you know, how much time can I really do here? Right. And Ira comes over and goes, "Listen, uh, can you stretch?" <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? He said, well, because the, the, the folk singer just called. He's stuck in traffic with this rain. Yeah. Can you stretch? I said, you mean go like from like three to three and a half minutes? I said, well, I, I'll, I don't know. I'll, I'll do it. As we're talking about this, and I'm getting more worried, in walks Buddy Moore, right. Larry Bresner, Jack Rollins himself. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. They all come right. to this place. Stand in the back of their suits. Yeah, uh, with the wet raincoats and yeah. umbrellas and stuff. And Hats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they introduce me. I go on. Mark, I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I did an hour and 20. Come on. I swear. I still don't even remember what I did. I just went. It was a belch. It was a vomit of epic comic proportions because it was all of us frustrated right, time right. with the group. Yeah. yeah. Just came out. Right. You know? And, and Rollins loves that, right? He know, likes when you push it out. There. I just went. Yeah. I just went. Yeah. And and they stood up, and, and the folk singer then arrived, and he sang May the Circle Be Unbroken, and then that it, was was a nice, it. it was a nice night. <laughs> and they they came up to me afterwards. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Janice is crying, and uh, and Buddy says to me, all right, listen, uh, that stunk, so let's go to work. <laughs> Did he say that? Yeah. <laughs> but you were getting laughs? I was getting, I was killing. Yeah. I was, I don't even, I swear I don't remember what I did. Right, but eventually at that time, they were sort of seeing the new comics come out, and I imagine that, you know, you were you're probably doing some crowd work and stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and, but it was like, it was a, <clears throat> it was like a miracle. It was, it was beautiful. A, it was great. Yeah. And then. You knew you could do it. Yeah. Like, if you, you know, your first weird gig out, you somehow did an hour and a half, you're like, okay. You know, it's oh, it's just trimming now. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now I go, yeah. oh man, I cheated on my friends. Uh-huh. They had no idea. Right, right, right. And now I know I don't want to do that anymore. Right. You know, with them. Oh, you got to do and, that. Talk. And now I got to tell them. Yeah. What I did. Yeah. And they were my best friends, and it was four and a half years of of you know stuff together. Yeah. yeah. And living on the road in dorms together and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It was more than just being an act together. Yeah. yeah. You know? No, sure. And I told them. And they were shocked that I did it, but they went, good for you. No kidding. I said, guys, I love you. Yeah. I really do. I got an 18-month-old baby that's sleeping in there. I got to do this, and I'm going to do it. Yeah. And and it, it, we had one gig coming up. Right. Opening for Melissa Manchester at the bitter end. Uh-huh. And she was hot like crazy. Yeah. Then, coming from the rain, and you know, she had good good songs. Yeah. And a great performer. If nothing comes from that, I'll give you that last gig. We ha- it's right. already booked, yeah. and I want to do that with yeah. you. Then I'm gone. Yeah. And now we get it sold out. It's like a perfect setup for us. Yeah. Everybody's coming, record people. Right, and, you know, right. It's, it's TV people coming to see her, and so. And we were killing, and I'm saying to myself, please, nobody buy us. Yeah, yeah. Nobody <laughs> book us for anything, please. <laughs> yeah. No, don't, don't, yeah. don't. And they didn't, and then that was it. And then I just did. Those two guys stay in show business. David did. David is still really funny. Yeah. I, I I saw him re- pretty recently. I hadn't seen him for years and years and years. And I still love the guys. Mm-hmm. And, and Al lives in New Mexico. Um, but really, I, what's his name? Al Finelli. Hmm. And he's a playwright now, and and um, and a photographer, and and stayed in the arts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just went. Yeah. I left them that one that night. The next night. I'm at Catch Rising Star. At the beginning, at so the, it was 74? Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Hoping so, to get on. Hoping to get on. Just waiting? Yeah. Was and, Rick and Newman there? Rick was great to me, because he knew that I lived in over an hour outside of Manhattan, and that I had a baby. Uh-huh. And he, so he knew my gig. Yeah. So he tried to get me better times. But I was so fertile. Yeah. I just wrote my ass off, and very quickly, I had a really good 20 minutes to begin with. Mostly impression driven. Some a little bit, but yeah. uh, but and, and it's an interesting story, and um, uh, that I'll get to in a second. But I, 
because I'd come ho- I'd come to catch yeah and I'd get on at maybe one yeah and I'd be done one twenty one and then you hang out for a second who the hell was going on before you at that time um, Eddie Bluestone uh, Richard Lewis uh, Andy Kaufman um, Belzer was the MC yeah. Freddie Prince right um, uh, uh, Leno yeah. And then David Brennan would come in and do an hour. Right. You Wait. Know, yeah. Did, so, were you going over to Bud's place, too? No, because it was too far west for me. Right. So I, because Catch was on the east side, I could get out in of Manhattan In the 70s, fast. right? 78th or something? And then, yeah, 44th yeah. and, uh, like, 8th and 8th, 9th, yeah. Yeah, so I could get out of town right, fast. Right, 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 yeah. It was really about that. Yeah. Um, I didn't become a dev- devoted improv guy till I moved to California. Right. Because to me, it was just a great room. Yeah. The improv on Melrose. The so original one, yeah. Yeah, it was great. And here, so, yeah. So I would, then I'd get home by three, up at six, Jazz had to leave for work at seven. Got the baby. Then I got the baby. So oh. that was my life, you know, for, I did that for like two years. Every night at catch. Every night. Did he eventually move down on the roster a bit? Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But pretty quickly. I started yeah. working pretty quickly, which was great. And my first, my first big gig well, I should back up. Yeah. I'm doing really good, and I'm, feel- yeah. I'm feeling like I, my purpose in life is being fulfilled. Right. It was a really romantic, fantastic time for yeah. for all of us. And <clears throat> Rollins comes to see me for the first time since... <laughs> the frat house. The frat house. Yeah. And he wanted to wait till I had marinated a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And he was hearing all of this stuff, you know, and I was, you know, I was really, I was really doing good stuff. Yeah. Um, and I know he's coming, and we're going to talk afterwards. So Jack, uh, Jack was, he looked like the Jewish Duke Ellington. He had the big eyebrows. Big, yeah, 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 yeah. but the big bags under his eyes, yeah, yeah, and always yeah. a little stub of a cigar, yeah. and tons of dandruff. They're almost like epaulets on yeah. his suit. He looked like a... A Brooklyn College English professor yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. I met but, him once when he was very old. Yeah. Yeah. And he lived to 100. Yeah. And I just destroyed. I had 20 minutes of so just boom. And I was, you know, I was I was doing, I was doing only then. I was doing a bunch of other stuff that were more uh, bits. Yeah. And I, I just, I crunched. Yeah. So we go out afterwards. And I sit down, and I'm, I'm like, I'm full of myself. Yeah, but yeah. you know that feeling when you just yeah, had yeah. just a yeah, beauty. Yeah, yeah. it's like a oh, great. Yeah. It's like you still like can walk. You can walk on your own sweat for a yeah. while. It's good. Can't sleep. Yeah, it's just like stop. so exciting. Let's eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jack's looking at me, and he, he spits a little bit of the cigar thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you think you did tonight? Oh. No, I know I'm fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, well, I did, the audience was great. Yeah, and he says, yeah. And now I, I, I feel like I want to stab him. Yeah, because <laughs> he's just, he's just yeah. not saying anything. And he goes, yeah, you know, Bill, uh, I didn't care for it. Uh, and I'm going, why? Yeah. And go, really, why? And I'm, try- I'm trying so hard not to yeah. leap across the table. Yeah. You didn't leave a tip. I go, what do you mean? He said, "All you did a lot of bits... There was, I call them toys and games. Uh-huh. There was all bits, but the audience had no idea about who you were uh-huh. when you left the stage. Um, you didn't leave a tip. A tip, that little extra something uh-huh. that you leave because it was good. Yeah. They, they, they said so. They, no, they I like the guy who did yeah. the thing. No, he's a nice man. He's a, that's important. Right. You didn't leave a tip. You never once said I. Yeah. I think, I feel, yeah. you know what bothers me? Yeah. You never said that. Any of it. I know what Ali thinks. Yeah. I know what this guy thinks. Yeah. I know what Mr. Rogers yeah. does. These are bits that yeah. you know. So, you're working too safe. Huh. You have to be ready and be prepared to bomb. You have to know what that feels like. Uh, in order to grow <laughs> you know these are like Talmudic huge <laughs> things to lay on a 25 year old you know yeah. stand up who just killed do, and who's six months just past substitute teaching who's yeah. feeling like oh my god my future's happening yeah. and it was it was gigantic but it totally changed my perception uh-huh. about what I was going to do uh-huh. he said so come back tomorrow yeah you know these things can work yeah and we can sprinkle them in as we go right right but for your own personal welfare yeah. on stage, yeah. 
don't don't do any of this tomorrow. Um, you're married, right? Yes. Talk about that. You're a young man. You're married. That's unusual. Yeah. You have a baby. Yes. Talk about that. Um, look at you. Who else has a baby? Yeah. Uh, Eddie Bluestone doesn't have a baby. Yeah. Belza will never have a baby. <laughs> well, look at that. You, you have it. You know. <laughs> Talk about that. And I and I went home. I didn't sleep. Um, I'm up all day with Jenny the next day, who's now the mother of two herself, and I'm writing stuff about being yeah. being the only man in the playgroup. Yeah, you know, right? Being the only, and it gave me an identity. Talk about how she was born. I did a piece about natural childbirth in 1974. Yeah, you know, that so that's what I was. It, and he pointed me in the right direction. And I and um, any comic who young person who comes up to me and asks me about that, I tell them that story. Yeah. Be prepared to bomb. Yeah. We're so... And did you? Oh, yeah. But till you find your way. Right. Till you find your way. Right. And then I learned, oh, if I... I could experiment with that, but I need that thing to end with. Yeah. So then an act starts to develop. Sure, sure. Always and, got Ali. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I got that, and then you throw <laughs> yeah. in this and throw right, in that, right. and then suddenly you... you, you, yeah. you know, But it was the approach. Right. It was the approach that was so amazing. And when Jack was 100, uh -huh. this was last year. He died shortly after, and I hadn't seen him in years. And I always kept in touch with him. I yeah. always called him. But he was such a wisdom-filled, menschy man. Yeah. So wise. You yeah. Know? He was my Yoda yeah. that way. And and the company had fallen apart, had broken up, and I wasn't with him anymore. And, and uh, you know, Robin, rest his soul, and I were like... We were like the children of the divorce when when Rollins and Jaffe broke up. And, yeah. Well, who do we go with? We love Jack, but we love Buddy, and we also love David Steinberg, the manager. That's we who you end up with, right? Yeah. Stanberg. So we, yeah, and and Larry. Yeah. So I didn't get Jack right as much as I wanted to. I go to see him in New York, and he's a hundred years old. Yeah. And we're sitting there, and my series, the comedians, was gonna uh, debut that night. Uh huh. And I was in town to impress and stuff like that. So I program his VCR with his yeah. with his his helper, his caregiver. Uh -huh. And uh, he was in and out, and I knew I had to get out of there. Yeah, it was getting emotional for me. And I and we both knew it was the last time we were probably going to see each other. Yeah. And I said, so Jack, ten o'clock tonight. It's all set up. Don't worry. if you miss it, you'll see it t in the morning. Yeah. So don't worry, it's all done. And I love seeing you, and I love you. He grabbed my hand, and he says, Are you happy with your work on the show? Do you feel good about what you did on this show? I said, Yes, very much so. He says, That's most important, because they can never take that away from you. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was, like, so amazing. Yeah. You know, and I... And I and, <laughs> I carry that around with me, you know. I've been fortunate to to have had good guidance. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing stuff. It's really amazing. Jack was amazing. He was amazing. Sounds guy. amazing. And 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 uh, it's all a beautiful moment. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. And it, so so when does uh you know how does soap happen? How does the first break happen? I come out here and uh, you move here. Uh, did not move here originally right away. <clears throat> we had a night at the... This was interesting. A night at the comedy store. Um, I was traveling on the road with Melissa Manchester. Yeah. It was her opening act then. And that was a great gig for a comic at that time. It's so. fantastic. Yeah. But it was it was kind of cool. You lived on the bus. Do 20 minutes, right? Yeah. And yeah. Sold out crowds. Yeah. You know, nothing on my head. Yeah. And um, came down to L.A., which was intoxicating. Mm -hmm. L.A. back in the 70s mm -hmm. was like amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, well, you could be on Sunset Boulevard and smell the orange blossoms in the valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like really, it was different. It More was, intimate business. Yeah, it was yeah. really cool. Yeah. And exciting and yeah. stuff was happening. Yeah. And so they have a night, the, the office sets up a night for me at the comedy store. Everybody comes. Yeah. I mean, it was insane. In the main room, the big room. Uh, no, there, there was, the original they, I don't room? think there wasn't, they didn't have the main room yet. Oh, it wasn't open yet. So yeah. It was a little box room. There. Yeah. Yeah. And... I look out and there's Jim Brooks and there's Carl Reiner and there's Norman Lear and there's all these things. And it went really well. Yeah. It went really well. Yeah. And now I'm meeting all of these guys. It's like being a, in, you know, in a Yankee locker room. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I go home to New York. Norman Lear calls me at home himself. Uh-huh. 
I so enjoyed you the other night. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, we have a part on All in the Family. Uh, you play you play Mike's best friend. Um, he's gonna get married on the show at Mike's house. It's a pretty good episode. And I think I thought you know I th- would you come out and would you think about doing this? Would I come out? Would I think about doing this? You know? <laughs> uh, yes, Mister Lear, of course. And then and Norman, just yeah, Norman. Yeah, yeah. Next day, I'm on a plane. I'm coming out. I'm doing All in the Family. Is that the first time you met Rob? Yeah. Uh huh. So now I'm cast as his best friend. We yeah. had a, it's it was the week after. The the Stivic baby had been seen on All in the Family. Okay, right, Sally and yeah. and, and Mike's baby. So it was a huge uh, audience, like forty nine million people saw like a medium show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No Archie. Yeah, uh, you know, no Edith. It was me and Rob and, and Sally, and I I end up getting married on the show. But uh, it's a funny episode. But we became. We had to play best friends, and it sort of stuck right away. Yeah. And we said, listen, it was good on the show, so let's just keep going with this. Yeah. And that's it. It's remained to this day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's who I saw you with him. At, that's when I last saw you at the yeah. Stanley Memorial. With yeah. Bob. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, uh, that was a big break. And then Paul Witt, Tony Thomas, Susan Harris uh, call, call us. Uh, they saw me in The Tonight Show. Yeah. And they were doing the series... And they they offered me this part mm-hmm. uh, to play Jody Dallas, this gay director of commercials, um, as p- part of this big ensemble. I had one line. The pilot was an hour. There were two half hours put together as a pilot. I had one line in the pilot, <laughs> but the second episode, I had this great episode with my mother where I'm in her clothes and she catches me and we talk about and she sees me and she goes, Why you get out of my Oh, you wear it belted <laughs> And it was smart and I and I met with them and it was a great pedigree. It was Jay Sandridge, who was one of the best television directors, Mary Tyler Moore show uh-huh. and, um and Susan, I just thought she was a genius and, and amazing writer. Yeah. And that's it. so I said, Okay. And it was a groundbreaking show. Groundbreaking show and I and I thought, all right, well, but wait a second, this is nineteen seventy six when the pilot was. America was a lot different, it wasn't as tolerant. I said, you know, but I have my stand up. Yeah. And but you'll always have that. You'll you'll you know, so I, I didn't want to be the gay guy from soap. I still wanted my own identity. Yeah, Billy was, Crystal. I just was starting to really get what's being on stage. It was getting better and yeah, better. Yeah. Was you know? SNL happening yet? No. Uh-huh. Um, uh huh. Well, yeah, the, the show had been on. Yeah. Um, yeah and were I, you up for that? I, I was bumped from the very first show. Oh yeah, you were bumped from the first. But did, how long did you? Were you mad at Lauren Michaels? A long time, but I did. I you know, but I understood it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the same time, at that time, you understood. I it? didn't understand it because of how it was told to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. About what went down. Mm-hmm. I, had, I, had, all right, the Friday night before was a dress rehearsal. I'm sorry. No, I. Know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, a, the was Friday night was a dress rehearsal, and I, you know, I, it, Lauren had had been all had had been <laughs> coming to the clubs, and he he loved what I did, and he liked my did, and he, he signed me to the first show, and all right, all right. Yeah. we had this deal in NBC with yeah. like six six appearances on SNL yeah. over, uh, you know, yeah. and then this, the, you know, then I'd become like the first non celebrity host, right, which is what he was talking about at the time. This is all on paper. Yeah, so yeah. we come to the first the first show, <clears throat> and it's uh, George Carlin is the host, yeah. and there's two musical guests, Billy Preston, Janice Ian, and I knew everybody in the cast, yeah, because um, they were coming to see me at the Bitter End and stuff, John and uh, Gilda and everybody. Friday night we have the run through for the network and a full audience, and my my thing just it it just killed, yeah, it, but it, it ran like five and a half six minutes, yeah. So now we have notes afterwards. And Lauren says, and Billy, I need two minutes. I said, you need me to take out two minutes? No, I need two minutes. Total. That's all. We, we're running very long. And I, 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 I didn't understand that. Yeah. Um, and throw in the fact I'm 25 years old, right. 26 yeah, years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. How could uh, my thing kill? <laughs> yeah. It just, it was the, it really was one of the stronger pieces in the show, if yeah. not the strongest piece. Wow. Now I got to call everybody. I got to call back, buddy. I got to call Jack. And I'm on at five to one. I'm in the I'm in the dungeon spot, you know. And I, I more than likely I'm gonna get dropped. Yeah, because uh, the show was running long. 
Anyway, so and it's wife, so you're waiting. Yeah, so now yeah. now we go. They're in the room with Lauren. They're going back. Lauren had other things to worry about. He's got the premiere of a network show. Yeah, um, I understood that. And Belzer's doing the warm up, and Buddy and Jack come out and says, "Come on, we're going." What happened? Well, he won't do what we want him to do. It's it's. I didn't have any other material to do. Right. I didn't have a two-minute hunk. Yeah. Andy had Mighty Mouse. Yeah. You know? He, right. So he had this amazing little piece. Yeah. I didn't have it. I was too new. Right. So, you know, I think the office asked for five minutes in the first hour. Yeah. At least have us in the first hour. And he'll take out whatever he has to take out. And he couldn't guarantee it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we ended up, I ended up leaving. Right. Um. And it was horrible, yeah, feeling because I, I knew that it was going to be groundbreaking, right? It had to be, right? Um, and so that was my that was uh, that was bad. Yeah, that was yeah. yeah. I came back the next year. Lauren brought me back. Um, I was on the show that Ron Nesson hosted, who was Gerald Ford's press secretary. Yeah, right. Um, funny guy. Yeah, and um, I did. I was on that show. Yeah, and then I didn't do it again for eight years until I hosted it when Dick Abersole was the producer. And then he became a cast member for yeah. a little while. Yeah, I hosted it twice that season. Yeah, and 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 then that summer, Dick called me and said, "Listen, I got a crazy idea. Yeah. If I could get Chris Guest and Marty Short and Harry Shearer to come, would you would you would you come as yeah. a cast member?" And I thought about it for like six seconds and said yes. I just knew it was the right move. It's funny because you guys did some great stuff. Great stuff. And yeah. people think that we were there for years. We were yeah. there one year. Yeah. We were all there one year. But out of that one year came uh, Ed Grimley, came Synchronized Swimming, yeah. um, became Fernando. You yeah, were yeah. What was the other Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the I Hate When That Happens yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, ball Players, which was a piece I did with Chris where we played two Negro League baseball players, right, a right. film that was so, so my favorite thing that we did that year. Um, Chris and I were always together doing stuff. And that was the first time you worked with him? Like um, yeah, but we were good friends. But it was the first time we really right, got right. the Right, Oh, that must have been gym. great. Oh, it was great. We had a, we, and it was a fantastic time. Can I just tell you how much I enjoyed the moment where you went, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I've told it, I've told this story before. But, but I, 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 that, was, that was a great, honest moment. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. So, so then, you know, after soap, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're doing the stand up and you get this, uh, I guess what happens though? You, you're a guy, you can act. You know, oh, I get, a, I, get a, a, I get a variety show at NBC. Right. I get my own variety show. Brandon Tartikoff, um, gives me my own show. How long did that run? Um, two episodes. Great. We Good did, run. We did six. Yeah. It was a summer, supposed to be a summer replacement. Yeah. Rock when Hutt- that meant something. Yeah. Yeah. Rock Hudson, um, I uh, was on. I, I don't. McMillan and wife or whatever was has a heart attack. So they don't. He can't do his show. Yeah. We had already taped uh, a show. Yeah. And he said, "You're on this week." Yeah. We had no promotion. We're up against Fantasy Island and Love Boat on ABC, which was gigantic. <laughs> yeah. I'm on NBC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ten o'clock. Uh huh. And it was, you know. It was just starting to find itself. Yeah. We the ratings weren't good. Nobody knew who the fuck I was, you know, as far as that went. I was the guy from Soap, you know. And you were doing we a monologue, week- you doing a song and dance It thing. was a big variety show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who was no song action? and dance. I had a monologue. I had, yeah. My first guests were John Candy, Rick Moranis, Dave Thomas from- uh, Doing sketches. Doing sketches, yeah. yeah. And um, that's where Fernando got born. Oh, yeah. 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 So, uh, so we did- t- The first two aired, and we didn't do any- Didn't do any ratings- and but the show was getting was starting to find itself. These shows need time. Sure, everything needs time. And and we were coming in to do the fifth episode. Two had aired, and I got in the office and I was you know I was like always fried. Yeah, because I I could feel it wasn't quite working. You know the ratings weren't good. But right, right. Wasn't. And uh, on the way in, a friend had called and said, "You okay?" Yeah, yeah, got a, we're doing a good show tonight. I got, you know, we got, it's really good. We got uh, Shelley Duvall and uh, Manhattan Transfer, and and you know, it was it was a good, sh- it's a good show. We're yeah. doing some better stuff. Yeah. And I hung up. I go, what? Did he asked me if I was okay. So I get into the office. <laughs> trades are on the table. <laughs> That's what uh, you uh, Trades are on my desk, and it says um, NBC cancels 
Philly Crystal Comedy Hour. Nobody told me. Right. The fuck is wrong with show business? Can you imagine that? Always, Nobody told me. Yeah. And then I had to go out and do the show. For some reason, because the pressure was off, <laughs> the shows got better. <laughs> I didn't give a shit anymore for that. Yeah, well, I knew we were done, but the shows got really good, and that, so that was. But that was a that was a terrible, terrible thing yeah, to yeah, do. You all right? Oh well, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. That, that phone call that when you, you hang up, you're like, what? Yes, yeah, the guy who ruins the surprise party. <laughs> so have a good time tonight at the party. How are you? Uh, the Yankees. The Yankees. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God! So it isn't easy. Yeah. So then, you know, I was back on the road. I was playing Vegas and yeah. doing all kinds of places, and it was, you know, because even if you fail, you were there. Yeah. So you know, you could make a little bit more money and play a little bit bigger places. And, and had so Jack Rollins told you what he told you when he was a hundred, maybe you would have been able to not take it so hard. Oh, but you can't. No, when you get canceled like that, nuts. No, it's, it's like everybody in the country looks at you and goes, uh -huh. no. That's mm. right. It's a terrible rejection. And also in the business, you know, you, 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 like, it's literally, maybe they ruined the surprise party, but you're still the asshole who's going to go out there. You got to do a show and everyone around you is like, mm. poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> There's that. There's yeah. that. And right. it was like, oh, uh, oh, man. You, I, did, you didn't sign up to be the victim of I, anything. You were no, doing a show. No. And so then, uh, then I did my second HBO special, which was a really good show. I've done six. Yeah. Second one was called a comics line, and it was a the opening was a parody of uh, a chorus line. Yeah. So I played all of these people auditioning for this special. Oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. really fun. I can't remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And that was uh, when Michael Fuchs was there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it it got it did it got really strong reviews and so on and so forth. And um, Dick Ebersole called me and get, said we'd like you to host the show. So now I was. Host in SNL. Yeah. You're a big comic now. I, I was, no, no. No, I mean, you're one of the guys. Because yeah. that's when, like, I think the, the nation started to recognize that you were the guy that did all the stuff. You did the impressions. You did the great comedy. You had the HBO specials. Yeah. Like, you were, you know, a top comic. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a really good time. Yeah. It was a really good time. But, but when did the movies come? Movies come at the end of Saturday Night Live. Because when Harry Met Sally is... Uh, that's later. The first movie was Running Scared. Yeah. With Gregory Hines. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, that was right after SNL. Um, and uh, so I was there for a year, you know. Yeah. And then, then that, and then that then comes Throw Mama from the Train. Funny. Princess Bride. Oh, that was all before Harry Met Sally? Harry Met Sally. Princess Bride with Carol Kane. Yeah. You played the little old guy? Yeah. Miracle Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Have fun Storm of the Castle, that yeah, thing. Yeah. And um I'm actually in Spinal Tap too. No, I know the mime. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And then um then Harry and Sally and then City Slickers and then yeah, so it was a great it was a plus, you know, I was hosting in eighty six we started Comic Relief. Yeah. So that was a great thing to be able to be with, with uh, Robin and Whoopi. And all the other comics. It was, now, were you it was friends really with good. Robin all the way through? Like, did you guys work together? Or we, did, was it really that that brought you guys close? It, that, that got us close. Yeah. We knew each other, you know. Right. But, you know, he traveled in a different world. Yeah. In, in the late 70s than I did. Mm -hmm. you know? And then... Slightly more dangerous world. Yeah. 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 But we always had fun times together. Yeah. But when we started to get thrown together in 86, it deepened. Yeah. And uh, and you know, he was a very sweet man. Yeah, yeah, it's a sad thing. And Whoopi, uh, did you know her before? Well, no, no I, I had met her backstage at her one person show. So whose big idea was it? Was it uh, Zamuda's idea? Uh, Chris Olberg. It was yeah, Olberg. Yeah, Zamuda. Yeah, Zamuda yeah. and Olberg. But Chris, Chris to is bring the one you who guys us. together. Yeah. Huh. And it was great. Oh yeah, it was history making. It was fantastic times, and to be with all the other comics, it was terrific. Great, and he meet great. new the, all the new comics every year. Oh, it's a, it's beautiful. You know, I, when when I was in Louisville um, for Ali's funeral, um, and I was, he had asked, we had be, I, oh God, this is, I gotta go back and uh, change the narrative. Um, I, right. I had I had done my first television show, yeah, with him, yeah, uh, just by chance. Yeah. So I uh, could imitate him, and he loved it, and you loved it, right? Loved it, and we became. 
really good friends. It's so weird. It's so weird. That's one of those things. It's one of those. I, yeah. I had it with my two heroes, Mickey Mantle and Ali. I end up being big parts of their lives at, at a time and their deaths. Mickey, too? Yeah. Yeah. He, he he was a hard character, huh? Yeah. Fantastic. Interesting. Sad. Ultimately. Yeah. But I ended up helping... Costas write his write the eulogy uh-huh. that he gave for Mickey in Dallas. Yeah, and Ali and I became great friends and important friends. And at his request, I was one of the eulogists. So backstage, huh. um, Whoopi was there. You know, they had like a green room, and I see Dave Chappelle, and Robin and I. When the first comer, I think I think it was the first comer, Ali. Got Chris to put him on when he was like seventeen or eighteen. Some young, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we fought for him to be on. Uh huh. And he, when I saw him, he just ran over and grabbed me and talked about that and got very emotional talking about you know yeah that he never forgot at that. Ali's funeral. Yeah, yeah, it was really sweet. It was really it was really. He's sweet. become very sort of like he's a grown man now. Yeah. you know, and he's got a lot of feelings, and you know, it's nice. Yeah, it was terrific. Yeah, and and when you eulogized Ali, how how what was the experience? It was awesome, uh, because now I'm sitting there. I first met him in '74. Yeah. Um, just starting out, I had yeah. this voice. I do this voice for him at this big dinner that was had become a, a television special. It wasn't a roast. No, no. Um, until I got up, yeah. and did him, and and nobody knew who I was. Yeah, I told the story at the eulogy. The Dick Shap, who was uh, was the MC and the editor of Sport Magazine. Yeah. They had made Ali the Sport Magazine Man of the Year for beating Foreman, retake, getting the title back, yeah. and all this. And he had called my agent looking for Robert Klein because uh-huh. um, Bob did a lot of sports stuff. Yeah. And he said, well, you could do five minutes on a dais with it. And they said, hey, Bob's out of town. He's not available. And she said, but I got this new kid, and he does this great imitation of Ali and Cosell. Uh-huh. He, it's three minutes long. And Dick said, sounds perfect. Just have him show up. So I get to the, I get to the, uh, the Plaza Hotel, and I, l- I loved Ali. I yeah. I, I so respected him, and uh, you know, yeah. just, I mean, there were two things you look forward to at a certain point for us: a Woody Allen movie and an, and an Ali fight. Uh huh. You know, those are two like huge events. Right, right. And sometimes uh, you couldn't tell what was more important. To yeah, us. yeah. And Dick said, uh, "How do I introduce you?" So I said, "Just say I'm one of Ali's closest and dearest friends." Yeah. Thinking I'll go into the co-cell, and that'll make sense. Yeah. And I won't have to talk. Right. I won't have to introduce it. I'll just boom, bang, yeah. right in there. Yeah. Another Scorsese kind of edit. Yeah. <laughs> and I walk into the ballroom with Janice, and I'm like, oh, my God, look who's here. There's, that's Franco Harris from the Steelers, and there's, there's Gino Marchetti from the Colts, <laughs> Archie Griffin, Heisman Trophy winner. It's everybody is here. There's Neil Simon and George Plimpton. Oh, my God. And I, I led up to the dais. I'm sitting three seats from Ali. And he and I told the stories and he, he's looking at everybody and seeing Ali in person for the yeah. first time. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, he was thirty three. Yeah. He was the king of the world. He had just defeated Foreman, who people thought was going to kill him. Yeah. And he was he was he was a float. Yeah. He was just an ice capades float. Yeah. He was uh, like a big. His head was enormous because it was shining and it was like, yeah. oh my, there he is. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> And he's like looking. He knows. He knows everybody but me. Right. <laughs> and he looks at me and it, with a look that I described as him thinking, "What is Joel Gray doing here?" <laughs> and and I, Dick introduced me after yeah. Neil Simon spoke and Plimpton spoke and his, you know. And the room was electric. It was electric because of Ali. And now one of Ali's closest and dearest friends. And I get up. Yeah. Two people clap. My wife and the agent. Yeah. <laughs> and I go into this. I go into Cosell. Yeah. Now, someone's yelling at me in the audience. I'm getting heckled. Yeah. You remember Bundini Brown? Uh, oh, he's a trainer? Yeah. Drew Bundini Brown. Yeah. 
he started Rumble, Young Man Rumble, you know, float like a butterfly, and he was a loud mouth guy. Yeah. And he's yelling at me. Yeah. As I'm doing my thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, we're here in Zaire. It's spelled Z A I R E. Someone pronounce it Zaire. They're wrong. Muhammad, come over. And this starts, someone's yelling at me. And I, I realized what he was saying was, you got a man. You got a man. <laughs> Be doing that man. Yeah, yeah. Be doing that man. <laughs> And I had to shut him up. Yeah. I'm I'm literally 30 seconds into my career. Right. Yeah. And I'm dealing with a heckler. Right. <laughs> well, how do you shut him up? Bundini, I'll handle this. I'll handle this. <laughs> bring the champ over. Just bring the champ. So now I'm getting big laughs. Yeah. And I could see Ali's like laughing a little. Right. And then I go right into the Ali. Yeah. Everybody's talking about George Foreman. I'll talk about George Foreman. They say he was going to kill me. George couldn't kill him by big laser punches. <laughs> I roped the dope was in. And I'm announcing tonight, I'm changing my name again. I got new religious beliefs. From now on, I want to be known as Izzy Yuskowitz. <laughs> Izzy Chaim Yuskowitz, because Chaim, the greatest of all time. It's Jew and, Jewish boxing, Howard. You don't hit the man, just make him feel guilty. <laughs> killing? Yeah, killing. 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 Beyond killing. He is next to me. And he's now a big St. Bernard puppy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, putting yeah. his napkin over his head. <laughs> he's trying to, he's getting up throwing punches at me. It was delightful. Uh, I mean, beyond belief. Yeah. Get huge ovation. Yeah. He hugs me and whispers in my ear, you're now my little brother. And that's what he called me for 42 years until the last time I saw him. Uh, yeah. And that was my, that was, yeah, I was pretty amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. What a fucking beautiful thing. Yeah. And, and those yeah. are those weird things, man. You know, those are those weird things. I know, you know, when you get a chance, I saw you on, um, I guess it was Let Letterman. Yeah. Talking about being with Mel and Carl. Yeah. And, you know, you get a chance to, to go to the museum. You uh, get yeah. a, you get a chance to, to see the, the, the Ten Commandments. I mean, that's, they're, they're that. And that. And I was talking about one of those moments, but being up with Dave. <clears throat> yeah. On panel, that was the first time I got to do that. You know, I had done stand up on a show a few times, but I don't, I never get the sense that he really knew who I was or anything. Right. So that was the first time in my career, and that's only a couple of years ago, where I was able to sit down as wow. a guest with him. And, you know, I can't even, like, you know, cause he was my guy, you know, I love yeah, Dave, sure. right? So just to have that and then to have it go well and to have him to sort of have that moment. You know, you only got that seven minutes. Yeah. Are you going to engage? Is this going to happen? Yeah. And, you know, you don't even remember it. You're in it and then it's over and it was like that happened. Yeah. But he was, you know, I felt him. Oh, yeah. That and was he, the greatest thrill. Yeah. Was um, was when I... You, you must know, have done with Carson, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but Dave... Yeah. Dave was like a peer. Right. Johnny was a god. Right. It was different. Yeah. I was in a totally different place. Yeah. I loved coming on with Dave. Yeah. Um, I loved making him laugh. Right. I, I, you know, I loved, um, our relationship grew. Yeah. You know, as a panelist, you know, where. Right. That's what you want. Yeah. You want to be one of those guys. Yeah. And it, and it got great. Right. It got great. I, I used to, you know, the two, three times a year you would do the show. Like, it was like I so looked forward to making Dave laugh and hanging out with him for a while. Well, that's what I did with Conan because I wanted to be one of you guys. <laughs> like I would see Richard and you and Leno on Dave, and I'm like, that's the guy. I don't want to be the standing guy. I can do that. Yeah. That's actually a pain in the ass. Yes, it is. So, you know, I can do it, but it doesn't represent me well. Why can't I be the guy like where they go like, uh-oh, here comes. I want to be that guy. Yeah. Now, like, let's just go through the movies a bit because, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I would imagine that even though you did all those other films, that when Harry Met Sally was such a comic masterpiece, that you know, that that changed the perception of the industry about you. Yeah, I th yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I think so. I don't know. I well, don't you know, know what they thought they're, about me. But like, I think people. What's amazing about you, and I and I mean this as a compliment, was that it's hard when you can do when you can carry as much you know comedy as you do to sort of like surrender the stage and be a, a straight guy. You know, in a comic situation, I don't. I don't think that people appreciate the significance and, and power of that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know when it's happening. Oh, for sure. I mean, I. You know, um, Magic Johnson. You know, won championships because he passed. Right. And he was a great passer. Yeah. And he could score when he had to. Sure. But it was he made everybody else better. Yeah. I. You know. I know who can do this alone. Right. And and I've been fortunate to be with, paired with great 
funny or interesting or great dramatic people. Mm -hmm. You know, where like with with Bob with De Niro, um, I was very much a straight man in that movie. Yeah, no, it was, and I loved it. Yeah, because I kept thinking about. Listen, I love Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. Stan was hilarious. Yeah. Oliver was more interesting to me because yeah. he had a he usually was on the, the the recipient of the of the unintentional hit in the face yeah. or the whatever it may right. be. And he would just look at the camera. He would look at the camera and go, "Do you believe the shit I have to deal with?" <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I with Bob, I you know, I he, it he was the funny guy. You know, um I, I, I developed that script and wrote the draft with Peter Tolan who was the first great, one. Uh, yeah, the yeah. first one. Um, before Harold came on. He's a great screenwriter, that guy. <clears throat> yeah. And and I would have to be Bob a lot in the writing sessions. I would do him as best I could. And then we got the script right, and I, I called De Niro. I did not know him very well. And um, I said, I have something. I think it'd be uh-huh. really, it's a, it's really funny. Yeah. And he said, send it. So we, we send the script. Two days later. He called me and says, I like this. Or I like this. Let's do a reading. Yeah. I want to do a reading. So he flies out to California, <laughs> and we cast the best we could. We got actors in. We go up to a, a, a boardroom at CAA, mm-hmm. and I'm now I'm sitting across from him, and he's hilarious. <laughs> and right away, I, I know my job. You know, I know it. I know what I do, and I'm doing it in the reading. Yeah. And he's laughing at me not doing much. Right. You know, I'm just, I'm like, taking it. <laughs> and I'm, of course, I played a guy who listened for a living. Right. I played a shrink. Right. And shrinks don't come right back at you. Right. He listened, and I was intimidated by him, which I was. I was scared of him, which I was a little bit. Uh-huh. But I also was loving the fact that Robert De Niro was having a good time, <laughs> and he's sitting across from me, right. and holy shit, this is going to work. Right. And that was that was fantastic. I love it. I love it. So I liked it. I love doing that. I'm a good listener. I'm no, a good but listener. but it's like I I don't think I I think that you were equally as funny. You, like I I think that the dynamic is what it is. In in that you, you know the way you process things, you're like okay. okay. You're like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when he says, "Listen, <laughs> if I talk to you and you turn me into a fag, I'm going to kill you." <laughs> No, right? <laughs> right. And I said, well, w- w- we should define what you mean by face. Look, if I go fag, you die. You got it? <laughs> and coming out of his mouth was just, it was genius. Yeah. You know, it was just genius. And, you know, nobody be offended. It's lines from the movie. Right. So, you know, that was it. it was, yeah. It's fascinating, though, that, like, you know, with, <clears throat> like, because I watch him now, like, you know, even in that the last movie, and I talked about it recently, The Intern. That, you know, he's a very amazing actor, obviously. Oh, sure. But, like, he can just tweak that character, the gangster character. Yeah. That he's played you know, over and over again. Yeah. It's just one knob turn to menacing. You yeah. know, like, how he does the comedy is kind of interesting. Well, this was his first real funny role. Right, right. And he was nervous about it. Of, oh, am I going to be able to play these guys again? Yeah. And, he, and it took like him a long time. I said, yeah. And I said, Bob, you're, you're, I, you're, a, you're an icon. I'm just saying that to him. Yeah. His face. You're different. You can always play that, those guys because you're so honest. It's so real yeah. that you know this guy needs to be real, yeah. and my guy needs to be real, and we're gonna our, our our styles. People will go, "What the hell are they doing together?" Right, but it'll work yeah. because we both are gonna exist in our own realities the best we can do it. And he took that, yeah, and it was great. Yeah, both of them and, are funny. And the fir- the first one, you know, he he says. This was, I think, pretty fantastic. Um, he tells Harold, um, "I want to change the shooting schedule. I don't want to see. I don't want to see Billy until it's time to see Billy in the script. I don't want. To, I want to do all my, all my anxiety stuff, all my stuff first. Yeah. So when I see him, I'm ready to see him. So they change the shooting schedule." And he and I was a producer of the movie too, so he asked me not to come to the set. Also, he said, "I just don't want to see you till it's the, please under and okay." Yeah. So Peter and I did a lot of rewrites and stuff and yeah. that stuff together in that time. So now we're going to shoot on the set, and it's my office, and it's Bob's entrance into yeah. my office, right? With um, with Jelly. Um, so, uh, 
we meet at six o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. And yeah. he's Trumpy and his son shaven, and so we go we go over preliminary blocking for the yeah. scene. And Harold's saying, "So you move in here." And I think maybe goes, let's just run it. And he's looking at the script, and they're just very sleepy eyed. Yeah. All right, and then where do you want me to go? I said, yeah. And I said, Harold said, "The shot's gonna break down." Once you come in and say, do you know me? And Billy says, yeah, uh, yes, I do. And then he goes, no, you don't. All right, no, I don't. You ever see me in a paper? I don't even get the paper. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then the shot would break up. Yeah. And Harold would say, cut. So I said, all right, it's going to be about an hour and a half. So yeah. we'd go and get dressed, get this, that. And um, I'm nervous. I'm a little nervous. Yeah. Har- Harold's were on the set, and then... Then Bob appears, and he's not Sleepy Bob. He's the guy. Yeah. He's Paul Vitti. He's dyed his hair. He's shaved. He's in a gaudy-like suit. Uh huh. And uh, he's scary looking. Yeah. It's that he. It went to eleven really quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, we do a quick little rehearsal, and uh, he doesn't say his lines. He's uh, just I'll be here. Uh, okay, okay. And action. He walks in. You know me? Yes, I do. No, you don't. No, I don't. You ever seen my picture in the paper? I don't even get the paper. And cut. Cut. Whoa. He goes, come here. De Niro calls me over. Yeah. And I'm thinking he's going to say, is that how you act? Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah. Instead, he says to me, in a very, he, he started whispering yeah. on this. He makes you come to him. Yeah. If you see anything that could be funny or something, yeah. you think I could do better? Just take me aside and tell me, all right? Don't don't say it, you know. To, but you know, because you know it's new for me. Uh, Robert De Niro is saying to me, if I see anything, I'm his acting partner in this <laughs> yeah. co-star. Right. If you see anything, help me. Yeah. It was uh, it was amazing. Yeah. Next take, yeah, right? Yeah. You know me? No, the same thing. Yeah. And cut. I go, come here. He says, what? I said, is that the, that how you're going to do it? That's it? And he starts to laugh so hard. Then we were great. Then we were just great. Said, that's, that's it? <laughs> and he loved it, and he could take a joke. And it right, was, right. It was, yeah, but yeah. it was, you know, I, I took a chance, and I won. <laughs> <laughs> Saying to De Niro, that's that's the best you got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. And that I, set yeah. the tone. Yeah, it oh, was great. great, great experience. But what, let's just talk about directing and about uh, a little bit about Mister Saturday Night and, oh, and cool. also about Woody Allen. The the Mister Saturday Night, I, I loved that movie because I was I was thrilled that uh, you had this horrible thing in you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it was one of those movies. Like I was, a, I I know that guy. Yeah, there was a lot of Allen in that. There was yeah. a lot of Buddy Hackett in that. There was a lot of these. Um, did you have a relationship with Buddy? Not really. Not I. We knew each other pretty well, but not not like I did with Allen. Yeah, I loved Buddy Hackett. Yeah, I thought he was yeah, very hilarious. Funny. So fun, hilarious. effortlessly hilarious. So, but like I was, I was happy about that that take on show business. Well, it was a take on those the guys who don't make it. Yeah, you know, it was, which is a possibility for anybody, anybody, it any was, generation. This was not a success story. Yeah, this was a guy who was his own terrorist, who had a, who couldn't handle pressure, who screwed up big moments in his career. We made them as funny as we could make them. Yeah. You know, he's the guy who followed the the, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Yeah. You're excited? I just bought a house. <laughs> and <laughs> and it was a comics, comics movie. Yeah, and I, th- I know? felt that, and I, I, was, I respected that. And it was lonely, and it was he was edgy, and, and um, it was a risk, because it was coming off, you know, uh, two really big, well-received movies, um, Harry and, and City Slickers. And um, Oscars, and uh, you know, it was like a really good time. Yeah, and and um, you know, the movie got mostly got really great reviews, and then no business. We didn't do any business, and that was that was hard to take. It yeah, because I I directed the movie, I'm in the movie, I co-wrote the movie, I produced the movie, and I had we had a 72 day schedule. Uh huh. 53 or 54 of those days, I was in severe old age makeup. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It was exhausting. Yeah. But I loved every second of it. And do you retroactively take uh, 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 Rollins' advice uh, and and appreciate the work you put in? Oh, big time. It took a long time. Yeah. Um, We had a screening of the movie two months ago or something 
um, Malibu Film Societies, like 350 people came. Yeah. I hadn't seen the movie since the premiere. Yeah. And it played like a brand new movie. They loved it. And now we're we're making it a musical. Really? Yeah, for the Needlanders, huh. um, who loved the movie, came yeah. to us and said, this could be a musical. And so Gans and Mandel and I, we've written the first draft. We had a reading the other day. And it's it's an edgy. It has totally has the spirit of the uh-huh. of the film, uh-huh. and and it could really be exciting. Are you so going to do it? I probably will. That's I exciting. I probably will. I haven't totally committed yet, but I um, won't need as much uh, makeup. No, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I had David David Pamer, who was nominated for an Academy Award for playing my brother in the movie. Yeah. Um, I had he came and he read Stan's part, and I said, David, it'll be a lot easier. <laughs> We don't have the five hours in makeup, man. <laughs> and you, you, did, well, you directed one other feature? Yeah, Forget Paris, yeah. and then um, which I, I really like that movie a lot. And then, I got to see it, I'm and sorry. And my favorite, uh, I love Mr. Saturday Night, it's special yeah. to me, but 61 that I directed for HBO. Oh, yeah. About Madeline Maris. Yeah. Um, that was a real passion project that, that I think to this day is like their highest rated movie made for HBO. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Do you like directing? I love directing. Uh, to me, it's the best job. Are you going to do more of it? I wish I had done more uh-huh. t- up till now. Uh huh. So we've written um, two little movies that I, I hope to get made that I will direct. I, I, I really love it, and I see myself doing that more, hopefully, as, as time goes on. Yeah, why not, if you yeah. can? Yeah. And and w- being that we sort of established it, you know, Woody Allen was very important to us, and you know, and and I know that feeling of the new Woody Allen movie. Yeah. Even as he just kept making movies, and you you were even able to go like, well, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I love Picasso. I don't love all of them. Yeah, right, right. But uh, I remember seeing you, you know, in Deconstructing Harry, which I like that movie. It's a, a lot. very good movie. It's a very good movie. And when he cast you as Satan, I was like, oh my god, what's <laughs> going? <laughs> Wait, did he just offer that to you? Yes. Did you ask him why you? Yes. And what did he say? I I think you'd be a very unlikely um, devil, and I think you have to understand um, that 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 I see in the movie you're my best friend, but I see you. I imagine you as as this guy who's going to take this girl from me. So that's you're the devil. Yeah. And 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 uh, I think you'd be you'd be very do very well. In 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 the pod, so when you get a letter, you get a handwritten letter uh-huh. and just your pages, uh-huh. and I had known him on and off a little bit um, through Jack Rollins through the right. office, they who managed him, yeah, and um, we got along great because I I just went out. People were afraid to talk to him. Mm-hmm. I just went and I talked jazz and I talked Knicks, mm-hmm. and that's and I and it was great. You know, he, yeah. he knew my family background. He actually knew my dad a little bit. Uh-huh. From I used to go to that place on yeah. Second Avenue. Oh, the record store. Yeah, to listen to to Sidney Bechet. Uh huh. You know, and so we t- I knew all of that stuff. Oh, that's so, sweet, huh? And um, I said, Woody, to me, the devil guy, yeah, is Hugh Hefner. I want to play him like Hugh Hefner. I think the the, yeah. the he's, you know, I, I think he's got like the. The Playboy, remember the, the Playboy Penthouse TV show? Right, right, uh, right. Um, you know, you, the show would come from either the Playboy Club in Chicago. Or People the, sitting on the floor and on yeah, the sofas. Some, and, there'd yeah. be, you know, yeah, yeah. everybody from James Baldwin to right. Telly Savalas. Right. And, you know, and and he loved that idea. And so that, yeah, it's a, and it's, um, it's a great cast and I, I, it's a really good movie. I, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And that was the only one you did with him, huh? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, sadly, I'd love to work with him at any time. How, how about hosting the Oscars? Is that done or? I probably. Mm. Um, I don't. You know, I don't, there's so many other. No, do you like doing that? I had a great time doing it for the most part. Do you look at when you're up there hosting the Oscars? Do you look it out out at the people there and and feel like you know this is my community? Yeah, the, especially the the earlier ones. Yeah, when my film career was was rising. Yeah, and the show needed a host. Uh huh. Um, they had had a couple of disastrous uh, hosting experiences uh-huh. when I g- inherited the job. Yeah. And I was ready for it. I had done three Grammy Awards. Right. 
I did the Grammys three times. It seems times. like a harder gig. Yeah. It's a bigger room. It's weird. Yeah. Right? And, well, now, I mean, the Grammys? Yeah. Yeah, now it's weird. Then it was Radio City. It was the Shrine. Oh, oh right, right. It was right. smaller scale. Yeah, till yeah. Now it's... A, now I don't even know what's going on there. No, it's, it's like terrible. A, a basketball stadium it's ter- or something. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, the venue. Yeah. The, the music is always great, but it's... it's so when I, you know, I presented one year and then I, then, um, then I hosted the first time. I felt part of the community. Yeah, I was. I was never phased. Yeah. I was. I can't say I was nervous. Yeah. Uh, and I remember walking out and there's Gene Hackman and there's Coppola and there's Dustin and there's Jack and Warren, and the first night, the first hosting job. Yeah. Was a complicated show, as I recall. They had satellite feeds from all over the world. Uh huh. So we had Sajit Rai from India. Yeah. We had guys on the space shuttle. Right, right. There's a, somebody from reading, opening an envelope in Paris. It was like a complicated thing. But yeah. I had one writer. Yeah. Who was that? Robert Wall. Robert! Yeah. Bob and I wrote the first. We did all the Grammys, just the two of us. The Must Grammys, have been frenetic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why would you say that? What do you think? He was very much like Scorsese, yeah. but a terrific guy and a good and good he is joke a sweet writer. Guy, yeah. And we we were a good team. And we had Jack uh, Nicholson had uh, the rumor was he made like I don't know sixty five million for the first bat. Yeah, the he made Joker. some some yeah, yeah. yeah some huge yeah, deal. Right. So I came out and looked around and this Jack Nicholson I started doing Jack jokes. Yeah. Jack is so rich. Yeah. Morgan Freeman drove him here tonight. <laughs> he was driving Miss Daisy. Was yeah. Big laugh. Jack is so rich, he bought land in Japan. Big laugh. Because yeah. Sony had just been purchased. Uh, By the so Jap- had just purchased right. Universal, yeah. whatever it was. Jack is so rich, John Peters still cuts his hair. John Peters was now the head of a studio. Right. And was a famous right, head right, of yeah. So that it w- couldn't have gone Good better. Stuff. Inside stuff. Inside stuff, but yeah. big jokes. And right. He was laughing like crazy and so right. on and so forth. And I'm uh, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Johnny stood here. Right. Hope stood here. Yeah. Like, I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm in my dressing room. There's an 18 minute break. Yeah. I have 18 minutes off while they do sound effects at intermission. I'm in a dressing room. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm they were refreshing my makeup, and uh, I take a leak and all this stuff, and I'm grabbing a sandwich. And who is it? It's Jack and Warren. <laughs> so I go, uh, Jack and Warren, who? <laughs> yeah, right. They're laughing. Right. I open the door. It's Jack Nicholson and Warren Beatty uh-huh. saying to me how great they loved the show so far. Thank you for doing it. Um. Thanks for making fun of my money. Yeah, Jack said to me, "Big hugs all around. Keep going. Have a great show, and maybe we can hang out afterwards." I are you kidding me? <laughs> Again, what a generous, <laughs> yeah. generous thing to do. Yeah, it was un. It was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It that's, was am- truly amazing. That's fucking beautiful. So I've had you know, I had very good times doing it. Um, you know, it's it's nice. Um. You know, every year that uh, where is he? I, right, I, right, I, right. You get I, that, right? I do get that, and that's nice, and and so on and so forth. And we decided, you know, how can we? And we did it with the Grammys too. How can we change what the host does? Yeah, you know, and and we did it on the Grammys. We did a lot of funny, innovative things on the Grammys. Remember the um, Leonard Bernstein Young People's Concerts? Yeah. He, well, f- so f- you people listening, he, Leonard Bernstein was a obviously a great. Composer and conductor, and um, he uh, he would have these specials with the orchestra, uh-huh. and he'd pick out the instruments and and do it for kids, young people, and he would teach you how an orchestra was put together, and so on, and uh-huh. and the different sounds of the different instruments, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so on and so forth. So I always loved that, and I said to to Robert Waltz, said, "Let's do a young people's concert, but the orchestra is Bobby McFerrin." Uh-huh. And Bobby could do every instrument there was right, right. vocally. Yeah, he could sing every sound like yeah, every yeah. instrument. And w- so we did that. We yeah. did it as a piece. Yeah, that music started in the in, in caveman times, uh-huh. and now he's doing some sort of drum sound in uh-huh. his mouth. Yeah, and and 
their rhythms w- became infectious, and now music comes, and little did the cavemen know that someday Michael Jackson would own their publishing. Yeah. That was the <laughs> joke. And it went on and on and on, and, but it was different. You know, it was different. So then we came to the Oscars, and we and I decided that, you know, there was this, the year before was that horrendous musical moment when Rob Lowe sang Big Wheel Keep on Turning. Yeah, bad, bad yeah. So the Oscars announced there's, there's no music. There'll be no music. Uh-huh. Right. They, so I said to the audience, there'll be no music this year. On the show, they applaud. You won't hear stuff like, you won't hear those medleys about the nominating movies. Yeah. You won't hear this. And then I did one. Right. And Mark Shaman, genius Mark Shaman, and and uh, Bruce Valanche and I and, and Bob uh, Walt wrote this, the first medley yeah. where we did songs about the nominated movie. Right. And it became like a big thing. Yeah. Then over time, we created the movies. Now let's put me in the nominated yeah, movies. Yeah. And so that became a thing. And then, so we had we had different things to do. Yeah, you created your own shticks for it. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then we did a very successful thing called What Are They Thinking? Where we put oh, right, people right. on yeah, camera, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah. and I would say what they would think, and I would improvise those right. things. And so we, it was, that became great fun. And, and um, You had a good time know. with it. Yeah. You uh, had to. You felt it, yeah. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's you, sort of a thankless job. Yeah, and you can't look at it like that. No. That's a that's a professional thing, and you have a lot of respect for jokes, which is good. Yeah, yeah, jokes are always good. How do you like? All right, let's let's talk about it for a second. The comedians was a show you put a lot into. You produced yes. it, you wrote it, you starred in it. You had Josh yeah. Gad with you. Yeah, it was a funny premise. Yes, it was something that was close to you, and it did it did not take off. Right. So how do you frame that in your head? What do you think happened, and, and what do you live with? Uh, I live with disappointment that that. Um it didn't succeed the way we had hoped it would, of yeah. course. We were working with Larry Charles and Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a great pedigree and yeah. Josh was great and a fantastic cast. Stephanie Weir and um Matt O'Berg and, and Megan Ferguson. Like great people. Mm-hmm. And um you know, for whatever and I think I totally thought the shows were really good. Yeah. And they got better right, over the sure. over the course of the yeah. time. And I and you know, we were fighting for ratings. We were all, we were the lead in for Louis, mm-hmm. and um, FX is a tough place to do comedy. Yeah, I think, and we we had a, we had a very devoted, too small a audience. <laughs> right, right, right. Which is not unusual for television now. No, yeah. a, you watch television in right. different ways, yeah. and and FX wasn't streaming the show, right. which I think hurt us. Do you too. feel like they hung out to dry a little? Or? Uh, I'm let's just say I'm disappointed that they didn't give us a chance for a second season. Right. In that uh, shows need to grow. Right. They need to develop. And I think that's true. From, from the, my own experience. From yeah. the yeah, from the third episode on, the third episode. We had to lay pipe with the with the pilot and so uh-huh. on that Josh and I would team together. The third episode, there was a really funny scene where we're, we're on our way to a kids' critics award show. Yeah, we, he and I have both been nominated for voiceover work. Right, because he was Olaf. Right, and I'm Mike Wazowski from Monsters Inc. <clears throat> and he gets me stoned. Yeah, <laughs> and we stop off on the way because we're hungry. Yeah. We stop off at a supermarket in the valley on our way to yeah. to the um, Nokia Center, wherever it was. And we just roamed the supermarket, ripped. Yeah. It was really funny. So now those who slammed us a little bit are writing, wait a second, folks, we were wrong. This show was hilarious, and it's getting better and better and better and better. And that started to happen. Yeah. So now we have a little surge in ratings and so on and so forth, and the shows are getting really good. It's on Hulu, folks, if you want to check it out for those who didn't see it. And then when we came up for uh, getting picked up, which I really wanted to do, because yeah. I felt we were just hitting our stride. You know? Yeah, and you were in it, and you liked it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the people, and... and um, it takes them like three weeks to decide what to do, and I think, oh boy, you know, we're in trouble. We're not going to get picked up, yeah. which we didn't. Right. And I had a long talk with the head of the network about it, who said, you know, it's very expensive. And when I, I said, but I said, so let's do less. We'd have to do thirteen. Let's yeah. do eight. Yeah. Louis does seven. Yeah. Let's do eight. Let's do eight great ones. And he said, well, Louis does whatever he wants. Let's move past that. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then it was, you know, so then they said, I, I, I feel terrible and I, uh, you know, but, and they didn't pick, so, and I'm, I'm, 
I'm over it now. Sensitive guy, though. This stuff hits you. It's very it, hard to. How would it hit not? you? Of course. You know, but like, you know, a lot of people, they, you know, in retrospect, they get diplomatic. They say it's show business. But it seems to me that like for you and for, for people like us, <laughs> you know, this yeah. shit hurts. It's, of course it hurts. Yeah. Because, you know, you spend a year of your life with yeah. people developing, writing, working with them. You give your, your you know, it's, listen, I get it. It's part of it. The worst the, part. The reasons why, the worst part. The reasons why they didn't pick us up pissed me off. Right. And I felt a little embarrassed about that and angry about it. That they what didn't have, reasons? They didn't have the money. Yeah. That the show was going to cost too much for the next season. Right. So I said, let's do less. Yeah. We'll do less shows. We yeah. have to do a full 13, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I'm mad that they didn't believe in it. They're walking out of the office. You're going, one. Let's do one. <laughs> one. <laughs> one episode. One 13 hour show. <laughs> You can break it up into little the, the Nicholas Nickleby of comedy. Uh, so I was, in a, you know. So listen, that stuff happens. I'm glad it's out there. People can see it. It's on Hulu. So, but I was really proud of what we did. Oh, good. Well, that's well, that's again that that, that Rollins advice. I'm going to remember now. Yeah, it's so important, and and for anybody listening, but no matter what you do, you know. If you feel good about what you do, they no one can ever take that away from you. And and try to ha- make that enough. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because that's you just please yourself. Well, look, you know, I I I think you're one of the greats. It was oh, very good. Oh, it was very sweet that you came and did this, and I hope it was good for you. Uh, <laughs> let's smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thanks, man. I really enjoyed it. One of the greats, Mr. Billy Crystal, and me. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, thanks again to our sponsor.